My father was, he is on the left here, my father was officer of the general staff of the Soviet army. He was inspector of land forces, Soviet troops stationed in countries like Mongolia, Cuba, East European countries. This is the picture taken at the entrance of my Institute of Oriental Languages. It's a part of Moscow State University. As every Soviet student, I was, quote unquote, volunteering for harvesting grain in Kazakhstan. By the end of my training in school, I was recruited by the KGB. This picture was taken on that day, and you can see again how happy it feels to be recruited by the KGB. Pay special attention to number of bottles on the table. One of my functions was to keep foreign guests permanently intoxicated the moment they land at Moscow airport. In 1967, the KGB attached me to this magazine, Look Magazine. A group of 12 people arrived to USSR from the United States to cover the 50th anniversary of October Socialist Revolution in my country. From the first page to the last page, it was a package of lies. Our conversation is with Mr. Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov. Mr. Bezmianov was born in 1939 in a suburb of Moscow. He was the son of a high-ranking Soviet Army officer. He was educated in the elite schools inside the Soviet Union and became an expert in Indian culture and Indian languages. He had an outstanding career with Novosti, which was the, and still is, I should say, the press arm or the press agency of the Soviet Union. It turns out that this is also a front for the KGB. One of his interesting assignments was to brainwash foreign diplomats when they visited Moscow. And he'll tell us a little bit about how they did this and how they planted information which eventually wound up in the press of the free world. He escaped to the West in 1970 after becoming totally disgusted with the Soviet system and he did this at great risk to his life. He certainly is one of the world's outstanding experts on the subject of Soviet propaganda and disinformation and active measures. Mr. Bezmianov, I'd like to begin by having you tell us a little bit about some of your childhood memories. Well, the most vivid memory of my childhood was Second World War, or to be more precise, the end of the Second World War, when all of a sudden, United States, from a friendly uh, nation, which helped us to defeat Nazism, turned overnight into a, a deadly enemy. And it was very shocking because uh, all newspapers were trying to present an image of belligerent, aggressive American imperialism. Most of the things that we were taught is that United States is aggressive power, which is just about to invade our beautiful free socialist country, uh, that American CIA is dropping Colorado beetles on our beautiful potato fields to eliminate our crops. And each schoolboy had a, a picture of Colorado bug on the, on the back page of his notebook. And we were instructed to go into collective fields to search for those little Colorado bugs. Of course, we couldn't find any. Neither we could find ma many potatoes. And that was explained again by the encroachments of the decadent imperialist power. Um, the anti-American paranoia, hysteria in, in the Soviet propaganda was to such an, uh, of such a higher degree uh, that many less skeptical people or less stubborn would really believe that the United States is just about to invade our beautiful motherland and some secretly hope that it will come true. That's interesting. Yes. Well, getting back to uh, life inside the Soviet Union or inside communist countries in general, in this country, uh, at the university level primarily, we read and hear that uh, the Soviet system is different from ours, but not that different, and that there is a convergence uh, developing between all of the systems of the world, and that really it doesn't make an awful lot of difference what system you live under because you have corruption and dishonesty and tyranny and all that sort of thing. From your personal experience, what is the difference between life under communism and life in the United States? Well, life is obviously very much different for, for simple reason that uh, the Soviet Union is a state capitalist economically. It's a state capitalism 
where an individual has absolutely no rights, no value, his life is nothing, it's just like an insect, he is disposable, whereby in the United States even the, the, even the worst criminal is treated as a human being, he has a fair trial, and some of them capitalize on their crimes, they, they publish their memoirs in their prisons, and uh, get handsomely paid by your crazy publishers. Uh, the uh, differences, of course, in the daily life are very various, uh, depending on who or whom we are talking about. In my own private life, I never suffered from communism simply because I was brought up in a family of high-ranking military officer. Uh, most of the doors were open for me. Most of my expenses were paid by the government, and I never had any troubles in, uh, with the authorities or, or with the police. So, in other words, I, I would say I, I enjoyed, or I had good reasons to enjoy all the advantages of so-called socialist uh, system. Mm -hmm. My main uh, motivations to defect was, had nothing to do with affluence. It was mainly moral indignation, moral protest, rebellion against the inhuman methods of, of the Soviet system. Well, specifically, what did you object to? I objected, first of all, against oppression of my own dissidents and intellectuals. And that was the most disgusting thing that, that I witnessed as a, as a young man, young student, who was brought up a, a very troublesome period in our history, from Stalin to Khrushchev, from total tyranny and oppression to some kind of liberalization. Second, when I started working for the Soviet embassy in India, I, to my horror, I discovered that we are millions times more oppressive than any colonial or imperialist power in the history of mankind. That my country brings to India not freedom, progress and, and friendship between the nations, but uh, racism, exploitation and slavery. And, and of course economical inefficiency to this country. Since I fell in love with India, uh, I developed something which by KGB standards is an extremely dangerous thing. It's called split loyalty. When an agent likes a country of assignment more than his own country. I literally fell in love with this beautiful country, a country of great contrasts, but also great humility, great tolerance and, and if philosophical and intellectual freedoms. My ancestors used to live in caves and eat raw meat when India was a highly civilized nation 6,000 years ago. So obviously the choice was not to the advantage of my own nation. I decided to defect and to entirely dissociate myself from that brutal regime. Mr. Besmianov, uh, we've read a lot about the concentration camps and the slave labor camps under the Stalin regime. Now the general impression in America is that those things are part of the past. Are they still going on today, or what is the yes. status? Yes. There is no qualitative change in, in the Soviet concentration camp system. Uh, there are changes in, in numbers of prisoners. Again, this is uh, un unreliable Soviet statistics. We don't know how many political prisoners are there in the Soviet concentration camps. But we sure know from, from various sources that at each uh, particular time there are close to uh, 25 to 30 million of Soviet citizens who are virtually kept as slaves in forced labor camp system. The size of the uh, population of a uh, ca country like Canada is serving terms as, as prisoners. Incredible. So um, I would say that those intellectuals who try to convince American public that concentration camp system is a thing of a past are either conscientiously misleading public opinion or they are not in very intellectual people. They, they are selectively blind. They, don't, they lack um, intellectual honesty when they say that. Well, we've spoken about the intellectuals in this country and also the intellectuals in the Soviet Union. What about down at the broad mass level? Do the people in general, the, worker, the working people, the workers in general in the Soviet Union, do they support the system? Do they tolerate it? What is their attitude? Well, average Soviet citizen, if there is such an animal, of course, does not like the system because it hurts, it kills. 
he may not understand the the reasons. He, he may not have enough information or or educational background to understand. Uh, but I doubt very much there are many people who are uh, conscientiously supporting the Soviet system. There are not such such people in USSR. Even those who have all the reasons to enjoy socialism, people like myself, who were a member of journalistic elite, uh, they they also hate the system for, for different reasons, though. Not because they lack material affluence, but because they are unfree to think, they are in constant fear, duplicity, split personality. And this is the greatest tragedy for my nation. Well, what do you think are the chances of the people actually overcoming their system or replacing it? Uh, there is a great possibility that system will sooner or later be, be destroyed from within. There is a self-destructive mechanism built in, into any socialist or communist or fascist system uh, because there is lack of feedback, because the system does not rely upon loyalty of, of population. But until, and until this Soviet junta is being supported by the Western so-called imperialists, that is, multinational companies, establishments, governments, uh, and let's face it, uh, intellectuals, so-called academia in the United States is famous for supporting the Soviet system. Uh, as long as the Soviet junta will keep on receiving credits, money, technology, grain deals, and political recognition from all these traitors of democracy or freedom, uh, there is no hope, there is not much hope for, for changes in, in my country. And the system will not collapse by itself simply because it's, it's being nourished by so-called American imperialism. This is the greatest paradox in history of mankind when uh, capitalist world supports and actively nourishes its own destroyer, destructor. Hmm. I think you're trying to tell us something. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm trying <laughs> to tell you that it, it has to be stopped unless you want to end up in, in gulag system and enjoy all the advantages of socialist uh, equality. Uh, working for free, catching fleas on your body, sleeping on, on the planks of plywood in, in Alaska this time, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's where Americans will belong, unless they will wake up, of course, and force their government to stop aiding Soviet fascism. Mm -hmm. Well, you told us a moment ago why you left the system. I'd like to hear the details of how you did it. It must have been a very dangerous thing. It was not so dangerous. It was crazy. Uh, first of all, because defecting in India is virtually impossible, thanks to very strong pressure from the Soviet government. Excuse me, you were in India, India. on assignment at yes, that time? Yes, I was working for the Soviet embassy in New Delhi as a press officer, mm -hmm. and uh, defecting for a Soviet diplomat is next to impossible. It's a suicide, as I said, because a great friend Indira Gandhi um, pushed a law through parliament which says, and I quote, no defector from any country has a right of political asylum in any embassy on the territory of Indian Republic, which is a masterpiece of hypocrisy. No other defector but the Soviet one needs a political asylum. So knowing that perfectly well, I, I, I planned a craziest possible way to defect. I studied contraculture in India. There, are, there were thousands of young American boys and girls with no shoes, long hair, smoking hush and marijuana, studying sometimes uh, Indian philosophy, sometimes simply pretending that they study. And they greatly annoyed Indian police and they were laughing stock of Indians uh, because obviously they, they were good for nothing students. I studied carefully where they congregate, what routes they travel, what language they speak, what do they smoke. And one day I simply joined a group of hippies to avoid detection of Indian police. I was dressed as a typical hippie with uh, blue jeans, uh, long kameez shirts with all kind of nice decorations like beads, long hairs. 
I, I, I bought a wig because for several weeks I had to turn myself from a conservative Soviet diplomat into a very progressive American hippie. And that was the only way that, that I could uh, avoid uh, detection. It was a very interesting experience, uh, but it was necessary because um, from my own knowledge as a, as a member of Soviet embassy staff, I knew that there were many cases when Soviet defectors were betrayed by Indian police, and also some Western embassies played a very dirty role in betraying the Soviet defectors. According to our information, they were some, I wouldn't call them double agents, but simply immoral people working for, this, uh, for the United States Embassy. And uh, confiding in, in people like this would be a suicide. So I had to be extremely careful. I could not trust anyone. It, and that was the that was the reason for such a crazy way to defect. Well, had you been uh, caught in the act of trying to get out, what would have no. happened to you? Oh, uh, most likely I would uh, end up in, in concentration camp. Uh, or, depending on the situation and on, on, the, on the whim of some bureaucrat in KGB, uh, maybe even executed. That this is normal practice. Quietly, of course, not publicly. But that would be the end of my defection, of course. Well, when did you finally make it to the United States? Uh, in 1970, after about six months of debriefing in Athens by the CIA, and I presume FBI too, they let me go first to Germany, then to Canada. That was my decision. I had to change my identity to protect my family and my friends in, in USSR. And also, I was a little bit paranoid, uh, knowing that both Soviet KGB and probably some double agents within the American system may be after me. So I wanted to settle down as far away as possible. Uh, I requested CIA to give me some kind of new identity and just let me go uh, on my own. And I settled in Canada. I was a student. Uh, I changed many professions from farm help and, and laundry truck driver to instruct, language instructor and broadcaster for Canadian Broadcasting Corporations in Montreal. Well, have you had any threats on your life or any uh, yes. unpleasant Uh In about five years, KGB eventually discovered that I am working for Canadian Broadcasting. Uh, see, I made a very big mistake. I started, talk, I started working for Overseas Service of CBC, which is similar to Voice of America, in Russian language. And of course, uh, monitoring service in USSR picked up every new voice. Uh, every new announcer, would, they, they would make it a point to discover who he is. And in five years, sure enough, slowly but surely, they discovered that I am not Thomas Schumann, that I am Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov, and that I am working for Canadian Broadcasting, and undermining beautiful detente between Canada and USSR. And the Soviet ambassador Alexander Yakovlev made it his personal effort to discredit me. He complained to Pierre Trudeau, who is known to be a little bit soft on socialism. And um, the management of CBC behaved in a very strange, cowardly way, unbecoming to representatives of a independent country like Canada. They listened to every suggestion that Soviet ambassador gave, and they started shameful investigation analyzing content of my broadcasts to USSR. And sure enough, they discovered that some of my statements were probably to, um, would be uh, offending to the Soviet Politburo. So I had to, to leave my, my job. And of course, subtle intimidations. They would say something like, please cross the street carefully because, you know, traffic is very heavy in Quebec. And um, Fortunately, I know about the psychology and, and the logic of activity of the KGB, and I never allowed myself to be intimidated. This is the worst thing. This is what they expect a person, mm -hmm. a defector, to be intimidated. Once they spot that, that you are scared, they keep on developing that line, 
Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, eventually you either have to give up entirely and, and, and work for them, or you, they neutralize you. They, they, they would definitely stop all kind of political activity, which they failed to do in my case, mm -hmm. because I was stubbornly working for the Canadian Broadcasting. And um, in response to their intimidations, I said that, look, this is a free country and uh, I am as free as you are. And I also can drive very fast. And um, gun control is not yet established in Canada. So I had a couple of good shotguns in my mm. basement. So welcome to visit me someday with your Kalashnikovs machine guns. So obviously it didn't work. Intimidation didn't work. So they, they tried different approach, as I described. They approached on the highest level, on the level of Canadian bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and on that level, they were on successful. On that level, they were successful. On individual level, they failed flat. Mr. Bezmenov has brought a series of slides with him that he has taken from the Soviet Union, and I think this is a good time to uh, take a look at the slides. Yes. Now, the viewers will be able to see these slides as, as we talk about them. Yes, this okay. is a collection of slides which are, some of them are, uh, snapshots from my family album. Some of them are documents which I smuggled from the Soviet Embassy, and some are reproductions from local mass media. I usually show them to establish my credibility as, mm -hmm. as a defector. This is a picture of, of my native town, Metishe, about 20 miles north from Moscow. Uh, characteristically, there is a statue of Comrade Lenin in the central square. Uh, this is myself at the age of seven. Again, characteristically, under the statue of Comrade Stalin, extending his friendly hand to peoples of the world. Uh, at that age, of course, uh, I was still idealistically minded young communist, and um, I still believe that sooner or later things will go for better. But I realized that the system stinks, that something is fishy, and that ideology is, is fake and the uh, propaganda about ad advanced Soviet agriculture simply didn't meet the criteria of reality. If they talk about uh, abundance of food and, and there is none in the stores, there must be something wrong. Um, my father was, he is on the left here, my father was um, officer of the general staff of the Soviet army. He was inspector of land forces, Soviet troops stationed in countries like Mongolia, Cuba, uh, East European countries. Were he alive today, most likely he would be inspecting Soviet troops in, in Nicaragua, Angola, and many other parts of the world. Fortunately, he died and he didn't see the disgrace because deep inside he was a Russian patriot. He didn't, he didn't like the idea of expanding Soviet military might, especially in the areas where, where we were not welcomed at all. Unlike many other military officers, he was reporting directly to the Minister of Defense bypassing KGB and diplomatic service. In other words, he was a trusted military professional. And my impression that this type of people are much less hawkish and adventuristic than party bureaucrats in Kremlin. When American mass media describes Soviet military as potentially dangerous counterpart for, for Pentagon, I simply laugh because I know better. I know that the most dangerous part of the Soviet power structures are not military at all. Most likely, if they come to power in my country, they'll be more sensible negotiators for nuclear disarmament and withdrawal of the Soviet troops from many parts of the world. But if someone from the party structure or the KGB structure were to give the orders for a military They have to obey, they, they yes, would because they are, they, are, they are professional military. But they, mm -hmm. you see, the triangle of power and hate in USSR is the party at the top, mm -hmm the party elite, the oligarchy of the party, then the military and the KGB at the bottom. Mm -hmm. They hate each other. And uh, the most hated triangle, uh, the most hated corner of the triangle is the Communist Party bureaucrats. They are the most adventuristic, senile megalomaniacs. They can start war, I wouldn't be surprised. Not the military. They know what war is. Yes. At least my father <laughs> did. This is the picture taken at the, at the entrance of my Institute of Oriental Languages. It's a part of Moscow State University. I uh, graduated in 1963. 
and I. Now, excuse me. Which one were you on? I I am on the right. You're on the right. And on the left is my uh, call, uh, my schoolmate Vadim Smirnov, who later was a apparatchik in the Central Committee of the Soviet Union Communist Party. What is an apparatchik? It's it's a it's a function. It's something like civil service yeah. in British Empire. Some someone who is never fired from from the service. Oh, okay. He stays there internally. He may not be promoted too high, but he's a dependable um, bureaucrat who will stay mm -hmm. forever. Uh, I studied not only languages but also history, literature, e even music. I'm, I'm on this picture. I'm trying to learn how to play musical in, uh, Indian musical instrument. I even tried to look like an Indian when I was a second year student. Not bad, right? Really. Uh, yes. Uh, the, actually, it was strongly in encouraged by the, by the instructors in my school because uh, this, the graduates of my school were later on employed as diplomats, foreign journalists, or spies. Uh, as every Soviet student, I was, quote unquote, volunteering for harvesting grain in Kazakhstan. This is a, a biggest. Uh, agricultural blunder of the Soviet government. Uh, but um, I didn't have much choice, of course, because the communist motto borrowed from the Bible says, those who do not work shall not eat. And you can see me eating, therefore I was working. And you can see how happy I was about it. I went through a very extensive physical and military training, uh, including the manure, uh, uh, including the uh, military games in, in uh, uh, areas, uh, suburban areas of Moscow. And here, for example, we are on a tour in Arkhangelsk area. And by the end of my training in school, I was recruited by the KGB. This picture was taken on that day. And you can see again how happy it feels to be recruited by the KGB. Our conversation with Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov, who is a defector from the Soviet Union, a former propaganda agent for Novosti and the KGB. We'll continue after this message. Uh, as every student in USSR, I, I went through very extensive physical and military training and civil defense training too. Unlike in the United States, where civil defense is virtually non-existent, zero. Uh, in USSR, every uh, student, whatever is major subject, has to go through very extensive four-year military and civil defense training. You can see me here with a group of students during one of the war games in near, near Moscow. Uh, the main idea, of course, is to prepare a huge reserve army of, of, of the USSR. Each student has to, to graduate as a junior lieutenant. In my case, it was administrative and military intelligence service. My first assignment was to India as a translator with the Soviet Economical Aid Group building refinery complexes in Bihar state and Gujarat state. At that time, I was still naively, uh, idealistically believing that what I was doing contributes to the understanding and cooperation between the nations. Uh, it took me quite a number of years to realize that what we were bringing to India was a new type of colonialism, thousand times more oppressive and exploitative than any colonialism or imperialism in, in history of mankind. Uh, but at that time, I was still hoping that, well, maybe it's not that bad, could be worse, and things may go for better. And I even tried to implement the beautiful Marxist motto, proletarians of all the countries unite. I tried to unite with a nice Indian girl. <laughs> and I was actually, I was fascinated by Indian culture, by, by the family life in, in this country. But obviously, Communist Party had different plans for my genes, so I had to marry this beautiful Russian girl. Uh, in the span of my career, I married three times. Most of these marriages were marriages of convenience on advice from the Department of Personnel. This is normal practice in USSR. When a Soviet citizen is assigned to a foreign job, he has to be married, either to keep family in USSR as hostages, or if it's a convenience marriage like mine, 
so that the husband and wife are virtually informers on each other to prevent defection or uh, contamination by decadent imperialist or capitalist ideas. In my case, I hated that girl so much that the moment I landed in Moscow, we, uh, we were divorced and I, uh, I married later, second time. By the end of my first assignment in India, I was promoted to the position of, of public relations officer. You can see me here translating a speech by a Soviet boss. And on you're on the right. I'm on the right here, yes. And it was, the occasion was commissioning of the refinery complex in Bihar, Barauni. Uh, back in Moscow, I was immediately recruited by Novosti Press Agency, which is a propaganda and ideological subversion front for the KGB. 75% of the members of the Novosti are commission officers of the KGB. The other 25 are, like myself, co-opted agents who are assigned to specific operations. In this particular case, you can see me talking to students of Lumumba Friendship University in Moscow. Um, this is the a, a huge school under the uh, direct control of the KGB and Central Committee where future leaders of the so-called national liberation movements are being educated and selected carefully. And some of them have absolutely, they, neither this for example is a group of students from Lumumba. They don't look like students at all. They look more like military and that's exactly what they were. They were dispatched back to their countries to be leaders of the so-called national liberation movements, or to be translated into normal human language, leaders of uh, international terrorist groups. Another uh, area of activity when I was working for the Novosti was to accompany groups of so-called progressive intellectuals, writers, journalists, publishers, uh, teachers, professors of, of, of colleges. He, you can see me here in Kremlin. I'm second on, on the left with a group of Pakistani and Indian intellectuals. Uh, most of them pretended they don't understand that uh, we are actually working on behalf of the Soviet government and the KGB. They pretended that they are actually being guests, a VIP intellectuals, that they are treated according to their merits and, and, and their intellectual abilities. For us, they were just a bunch of political prostitutes to be taken advantage for various propaganda operations. Therefore, you can see perfectly well the senior colleague of mine on the left doesn't really have that much respect on his face. And myself, with a very skeptical smile, uh, typical KGB sarcastic smile, anticipating another victim of, of ideological brainwashing. This is how a, a typical uh, conference in Novosti headquarters in Moscow look like. Uh, the, sitting in the middle is Boris Burkov, the then director of Novosti Press Agency, high-ranking party bureaucrat in the Department of Propaganda. I am standing next to a famous Indian poet, Sumitranandan Pant. Uh, he was famous because he was an author, he was the author of a famous poem titled Rhapsody to Lenin. That's why he was invited to USSR and everything was paid uh, by the Soviet government. The pay special attention to number of bottles on the table. This is one of the ways to kill the awareness or curiosity of, of foreign journalists. My, one of my functions was to keep foreign guests permanently intoxicated the moment they land at Moscow airport. I had to take them to the VIP lounge and toast to friendship and understanding between the nations of the world glass of vodka, then the second glass of vodka. And in no time, my guests would be feeling very happy. They would see everything in kind of pink, nice color. And uh, that's the way I, I had to keep them permanently for the next 15 or, or 20 days. At certain point in time, I had to withdraw alcohol from them so that some of them who are the most recruitable would feel a little bit shaky, guilty, trying to remember what they were talking last night. That's the time to approach them with all kind of nonsense, such as joint communique or statement for, for Soviet propaganda. Uh, that's the time they are the most flexible. And of course, what they didn't understand, they didn't realize or pretended not to realize, that myself, who was drinking together with them, uh, was not drinking at all. I had ways to get rid of alcohol through various techniques, including 
special pills which were given to me by my colleagues. Uh, but they were taking it seriously. In other words, they, they, they would consume quite a large volumes of alcohol and feel quite uneasy next morning. Um, in 1967, the KGB attached me to this magazine, Look Magazine, a group of 12 people arrived to USSR from the United States to cover the 50th anniversary of October Socialist Revolution in my country. From the first page to the last page, it was a package of lies, propaganda cliché, which were presented to American readers as opinions and deductions of American journalists. Nothing could be far from truth. These were not opinions. They were not opinions at all. Uh, they were the clichés which the Soviet propaganda wants American public to think that they think. Yeah, if it does make any sense at all. It sure does, because from the viewpoint of the Soviet propaganda, although there are some subtle criticism of the Soviet system, the basic message is that Russia today is a nice, functioning, efficient system supported by majority of population. That's the biggest lie. And of course, American intellectuals and journalists from Look Magazine elaborated on that untruth in various different ways. They intellectualized that lie. They found all kinds of justifications for telling lies to American public. Um, this and, is excuse me, it was partly your job to make sure that they got these ideas yes. and accepted them as their own ideas. Right. Actually, even before they arrived to USSR, and they paid astronomical sum of money for that visit, uh, they were submitted, uh, the, this Novosti Press Agency developed so-called backgrounders, 20, 25 pages of information and opinions which were presented to the journalists even before they bought their tickets to Moscow. They had to analyze the situation and judging on their reaction to that backgrounder, the local Novosti representative or local Soviet diplomat in Washington, D.C. would assess whether they have, whether they be given visa to USSR or not. Yeah. So but they were selected ahead oh, of time. Oh, yes. They were, they were pre-selected very carefully. And uh, there is not much chance for honest journalists to arrive to USSR and to stay there for one year and to bring this uh, package of lies back home. This, for example, is a centerfold of the, ty of, of the Look magazine. They presented this monument erected by Communist Party in Stalingrad as the symbol, personification of Russian military might. And they said in the article, which is published on, on the side, that Soviets are very proud of the victory in the Second World War. This is another big myth, a lie. No sensible people would be proud to lose 20 millions of their countrymen in a war which was started by Genosse Hitler and Comrade Stalin and paid by American multinationals. Most of the Soviet citizens look at this type of monuments with disgust and sorrow because every family lost father, brother, sister, or child in the Second World War. Yet American journalists who were trying to appease, to please their hosts, presented this picture on the centerfold as the symbol and personification of Soviet national, uh, they call it Russian national spirit. And it was greatest, greatest misconception and, and a very tragic misunderstanding. Of course, Look Magazine was not distributed in USSR. The main uh, audience was in the United States. But uh, I presume that many Americans, millions of Americans who were reading Look Magazine at that time, had absolutely wrong idea about the sentiments of my nation, about what the Soviets are proud of and what they hate. This is a group, you see the same lady with the sword in Stalingrad. This is the group of journalists. Myself is in the center with the same devilish smile. And Mr. Philip Harrington is on the extreme left there with, with his camera. Uh, this is the gentleman which was so deaf or so uninterested in what I had to say to him. Uh, this is the same picture, a blow up of the same, of the same picture. Uh, many, many guests from various countries, in this particular case from Asia and Africa, were taken by me as a Novosti Press Agency employee uh, for a tour across Siberia, for example. We would show them typical kindergarten, you see. Nothing special by American standards, 
just nice children sitting, eating their breakfast or, or lunch. Uh, what they could not understand, or they pretended not to understand, that this is an exemplary kindergarten. This is not the kindergarten for average person or average family in USSR. And we maintain that illusion in their minds. You can see myself under the red spot in the middle there uh, with the same business-like expression. I'm, on, you know, I'm doing my job. That, that's what I'm assigned to do and that's what I was paid to do. But deep inside, I still hope that at least some of these useful idiots would understand that what they are looking at has nothing to do with the level of affluence in my nation. This is a better picture which reflects the true spirit of, of the Soviet, chi uh, ch Soviet childhood. This picture was printed in a Canadian government publication by mistake. In the middle, you can see children playing on a, sm a small courtyard. And the caption goes, this is a typical kindergarten in Siberia. What these idiots didn't understand, that it is not kindergarten at all. It is a prison for children of political prisoners. Mm. But there was not a single mentioning that what they were visiting actually was an area of concentration camps. And the job of people like myself to help them to n not to notice that they are actually talking to prisoners. Most of the children were dressed, especially on the occasion of the foreigner's visit. Uh, the, uh, of course, there were no corpses in, on the ground. There were no machine gun guards. And, uh, they, well, it looks not very pleasant, as you see. It's a, it, it looks dull, but obviously it does not create an impression that this is actually a prison. Well, did any of the journalists have the uh, curiosity to ask about uh, prisons and that kind of thing? Yes. They were in Siberia. This yes. is what you associate. Some of, yes. Some of them asked questions, and naturally we, we would give them, the, for the stupid question, we give them stupid answer. No, there are no prisons in Siberia. No, most of the people who, are, who you see are free citizens of USSR. They are very happy to be here, uh, and, and they are contributing to the glory of the socialist system. Uh, some of them pretended that they, they believe what, what I was uh, telling them. And um, most of them, we may discuss it later, what are the motivations of these people? Why would they stubbornly bring lies to their own population through their own mass media? I have various answers to this. There is not a single explanation. It's a complex of explanations. It's fear, pure biological fear. They understand that they are on the territory of an enemy state, a police state. And just to save their rotten skins and their miserable jobs, their affluence back home, they would prefer to tell a lie than to, to ask truthful questions and, and report truthful information. Second, most of these schmucks were uh, afraid to lose their jobs because obviously if you tell truth about my country, you will not last long as a correspondent of New York Times uh, or, or Los Angeles Times. They will fire you. What kind of correspondent are you? You obviously cannot find common language with Russians if they kick you out in 24 hours. So just by, by trying to be conformist to their own editorial bosses, they tried not to offend the sentiments of the Soviet administrators and people like myself. Deep inside, I hope they would insult my uh, or offend my sentiments. Obviously, they preferred not to. Uh, another reason. Uh, I, did, I, I refuse to believe it, but obviously, there is another reason. Obviously, it's a greed. These people earn a lot of money. When they come back to USA, they claim that they are experts on my country. They write books which sells in million copies, titled like Russians, The Truth About Russia. Most of it is lie about Russia. Yet, they claim to be Sovietologists. They, they, bring, they play back myths about my country, the propaganda cliches. Yet, they are stubbornly resist a, a, the word of truth. If a, a person like Solzhenitsyn is either defecting or kicked out of USSR, they try all their best to, dis to discredit him and to discourage him. I don't have much chance to appear on national network uh, with a true story about my country. But a useful idiot like Hendrik Smith or Robert Kaiser they are big heroes. They come back from USSR. They say, oh, we were talking to dissidents in Russia. Big deal. Soviet dissidents are chasing American correspondents in the streets. And they are cowardly escaping from these contacts.
for some strange reason, if you want to know more about Spain, you refer to Spanish writers. If you want to learn more about French, you read uh, French or writers. Even about Antarctica, I bet you would read penguins. <laughs> Only about the Soviet Union, for some strange reason, you read Hendrix and Schmendrix and all kinds of Kissingers because they claim that they know more about my country. They know nothing or next to nothing. Or they pretend that they know more than they actually do. I would say they are dishonest people who lack integrity and uh, common sense and intellectual honesty. They bring back all kinds of stories like that. A kindergarten in Siberia. Mm -hmm. Omitting the most important fact, it's a prison for children of political prisoners. Uh, another greatest example of monumental idiocy of American politicians, uh, Edward Kennedy was in Moscow and he thought that he is a popular, charismatic American politician who is easygoing, who can smile, dance at the wedding in, in Russian palace of marriages. What he, did, what he did not understand, or maybe he pretended not to understand, that actually he was being taken for a ride. This is a staged wedding, especially to impress foreign media or, or useful idiots like Ed Kennedy. Most of the, of the guests there, they, they, they had security clearance and they were instructed what to say to foreigners. This is exactly what I was doing. You can see me in the same damn wedding palace in Moscow where Ed Kennedy was dancing here, you see, smiling. He thinks he's very smart. From the viewpoint of Russian citizens who observe this idiocy, he's, he's narrow-minded, egocentrical idiot who tries to earn his own popularity through, the, uh, through participation in propaganda farces like this. Here you can see myself. On the right, again, exemplary Soviet bride. On the left, three journalists from various countries, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Obviously, they enjoying the situation. They, they will go back home and write the reports. We were present the, on a regular Soviet wedding. They were not present on a regular Soviet wedding. They were present, they were part of a farce, of a circus performance. Uh, another thing which I had to sometimes risking my life to explain to foreigners. Time magazine, for example, is very critical of South African racist regime. The whole article was dedicated to the shameful internal passport si system where black, blacks are not allowing to live with whites. For some strange reason, for the last 14 years since my defection, nobody wanted to pay attention to my passport. This is my passport. It also n shows my nationality and it, it, uh, it has a police rubber stamp which is called prapiska in Russian language which assigns me to a certain area of residence. I cannot leave that area same way as this black man cannot leave the area in South Africa. Yet we call South African government racist regime. Not a single Jane, Jane Schmonda or Fonda is brave enough, courageous enough to come to media and say, look, this is what happens in USSR. I send a copy of, of my passport to many American liberals and civil rights uh, defenders and, and all the other useful idiots. They never, they never bothered to answer me back. This shows what kind of integrity, what kind of honesty these people are. They are a bunch of hypocrites because they don't want to recognize a good example of racism in my country. This is the first stage of befriending a professor. You can see myself on the left with the same James Bond smile. On, my, on the right is my KGB supervisor, Comrade Leonid Mitrokhin. And in the middle, a professor of political science in Delhi University. The next stage would be to invite him to a gathering of Indo-Soviet Friendship Society. There he is sitting next to his wife before he is being sent to USSR for free trip. Everything is paid by the Soviet government. He was made to believe that he is invited to USSR because he is a talented, sober thinking intellectual. Absolutely false. He is invited because he is a useful idiot, because he would agree and subscribe to most of the Soviet propaganda cliché. And when he is coming back to, to his own country, he is going for years and years to teach the beauties of Soviet socialism to uh, newer and newer generations of his students thus promoting the Soviet propaganda line. 
uh, the KGB was even curious about this gentleman. It may look innocent. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, a great spiritual leader or maybe a great charlatan and crook, depending on which, from which side you are looking at him. Uh, Beatles were trained at his ashram in Hardwar in India how to meditate. Mia Farrow and, and other uh, useful idiots from Hollywood visited his um, school and they returned back to the United States absolutely zonked out of their minds with marijuana, hashish, and crazy ideas of meditation. To meditate, in other words, to isolate oneself from the current social and political issues of your own country. To get into your own bubble, to forget about troubles of the world. Obviously, KGB was very fascinated with such a beautiful school, such a, a brainwashing center for stupid Americans. I was dispatched by the KGB to check what kind of VIP Americans attend this school. That's you on the left. Yes, side. I'm on the yeah. left. I, 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 I was trying to get enrolled in that school. Unfortunately, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi asked too much. He wanted 500 American dollars for enrollment. But my function was not actually to get enrolled in the school. My function was to discover what kind of people from the United States attend this school. And we discovered that, yes, there are some influential members of family, uh, uh, public opinion makers of United States who come back with the crazy stories about Indian philosophy. Indians themselves look up upon them as idiots, useful idiots. To say nothing about KGB who looked at them as, as, as extremely naive, misguided people. Obviously, a VIP, say a wife of, of, of a congressman, or, or a prominent Hollywood personality, after, the, after being trained in that school, is much more instrumental in the hands of, of manipulators of public opinion and KGB than a normal person who, who understands, who, who looks through this, this, uh, this, this type of, of uh, fake religious training. Why would they be more susceptible to manipulation? I just mentioned that because, you see, a, a person who is too much involved in, 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 in introspective meditation. You see, if you carefully look what, what Maharishi Mahesh Yogi is teaching to, to Americans, is that all, most of the problems, most of the burning issues of today can be solved simply by meditating. Don't, don't, don't rock the boat. Don't get involved. Just sit down, look at your navel and meditate. And the things, due to some strange logic, due to cosmic vibration, will, will, will settle down by themselves. This is exactly what the KGB and Marxist-Leninist propaganda wants from Americans, to distract their uh, opinion, uh, attention, and mental energy from real issues of the United States into a non-issues, into a non-world, non-existent uh, harmony. Obviously, it's more beneficial for the Soviet aggressors to have a bunch of duped Americans than Americans who are self-conscious, healthy, uh, physically fit, and alert to, to the reality. Mm -hmm. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi obviously is not on the payroll of the KGB. But w whether he knows it or not, he contributes greatly to demoralization of American society. And he's not the only one. There are hundreds of those gurus who come to, to your country to capitalize on naivete and stupidity of, of Americans. It's a fashion. It's a fashion to meditate. It's a fashion not to be involved. So obviously, you can see that if, if KGB were uh, that curious, if they paid my trip to Hardwar, if they assigned me to that, to that strange job, obviously they were very much fascinated. They were convinced that that type of, of, of brainwashing is very efficient and instrumental in demoralization of the United States. Our conversation with Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov, who is a defector from the Soviet Union, a former propaganda agent, for Novosti and the KGB will continue after this message. This picture shows the part of the building of USSR embassy and my supervisors. On the left is Comrade Mehdi, an Indian communist, and on the right, Comrade Mitrohin, 
my supervisors in the secret department of research and counter propaganda it has nothing to do with either research or counter propaganda most of the activity of that department was to compile huge amount volume of information on individuals who were instrumental in creating public opinion publishers editors journalists uh, actors educationalists professors of political science members of parliament uh, 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 representatives of business circles most of these people were divided roughly in two groups those who would tow the soviet foreign policy they would be promoted to the positions of power through media and public opinion manipulation those who refused the soviet influence in their own country would be character assassinated or executed physically come revolution same way as uh, in the small town of Hue in South Vietnam, several thousands of Vietnamese were executed in one night when the city was captured by Viet Cong for only two days. And American CIA could never figure out how could possibly communists know each individual where he lives, where, where to get him, and would be arrested in one night, basically in, in some four hours before dawn, put on a van, taken out of the city limits, and shot. The answer is very simple. Long before communists occupied the city, there was extensive network of informers, local Vietnamese citizens, who knew absolutely everything about people who are instrumental in public opinion, including barbers and taxi drivers. Everyone who was sympathetic to the United States was executed. Same thing was done under the guidance of, of the Soviet embassy in Hanoi, and same thing I was doing in New Delhi. To my horror, I discovered that in the files where people were doomed to execution, there were names of, of pro-Soviet journalists with whom I was personally friendly. Pro-Soviet? Yes. They were idealistically minded leftists who uh, made several visits to USSR. And yet, the KGB decided that come revolution or drastic changes in political structure of India, they will have to go. Why is that? Because they, they know too much. Simply because, you see, the useful idiots, the, the leftists who are idealistically believing in the beauty of Soviet socialist or communist or whatever system, when they get disillusioned, they become the worst enemies. That's why my KGB instructors specifically made the point, never bother with leftists. Forget about these political prostitutes. Aim higher. This was my instruction. Try to get into... into uh, large circulation established conservative media rich filthy rich movie makers intellectuals so-called academic circles cynical egocentric people who can look into your eyes with angelic expression and tell you a lie these are the most recruitable people people who lack moral principles who are either too greedy or to uh, suffer from self-importance uh, they feel that uh, they they matter a lot uh, these are the people who KGB wanted very much to recruit. But or, to eliminate the others, to execute the others, don't they serve some purpose? Wouldn't they be no, the ones they, they rely they on? They serve purpose only at the stage of destabilization of a nation. For example, your leftists in, in United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, the, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists when they come to power. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. You remember most of these uh, former Marxist-Leninists were either put to prison or one of them split and now he's working against Sandinistas. It happened in, in uh, uh, Grenada when Maurice Bishop was, he was already a Marxist. He was executed by, by a new Marxist who was more Marxist than this Marxist. Same happened in Afghanistan when uh, first there was Taraki, he was killed by Amin, then Amin was killed by Babrak Karman with the help of KGB. Same happened in, in Bangladesh when Mujibur Rahman, very pro-Soviet leftist, was assassinated by his own Marxist-Leninist military comrades. It's the same pattern everywhere. The moment they serve their purpose, all the useful idiots are used, either be executed entirely, all the idealistically minded Marxists, 
or uh, exiled or put in prisons, like in Cuba. Many, many former Marxists are in Cuba, I mean in prison. So most of the Indians who were cooperating with the Soviets, especially without uh, a de department of, of uh, information of the USSR embassy, were listed for execution. Uh, and when I discovered that fact, of course I was sick. I was mentally and physically sick. I thought that I, I'm going to explode one day during the briefing at the ambassador's office. I would stand up and say something that we are basically a bunch of murderers. That's what we are. We, it has nothing to do with friendship and understanding between the nation and blah, blah, blah. We are murderers. We behave as a bunch of thugs in, in a country which, which is hospitable to us, a country which, which, with ancient traditions. But I, I, I did not defect. I tried to get the message across to my horror. Nobody wanted even to listen, least of all to believe what I had to say. And I tried all kinds of tricks. I would, I would, I would uh, leak information through letters uh, or lost documents or something like that. And still I got no message. Uh, the message was not published even in the conservative mass media of, of India. The immediate impulse to defect was Bangladesh crisis, which was described by American correspondents as Islamic grassroots revolution, which is absolute baloney. Uh, there was nothing to do with Islam, and there was no grassroots revolution. Actually, there are no grassroots revolutions, period. Any revolution is a byproduct of a highly organized group uh, of conscientious and professional um, um, organizers, but it has nothing to do with grassroots. In Bangladesh, it was nothing with grassroots. Most of the uh, Avami League party members, Avami League means People's Party, uh, were trained in Moscow in the high party school. Most of the Mukti Fauj leaders, Mukti Fauj in Bengali means People's Army, same as SWAPO and, and all kind of liberation armies all over the world, the same bunch of useful idiots. They were trained at Lumumba University and various centers of the KGB in Simferopol, in, in Crimea, and in Tashkent. So when I saw that India, Indian territory is being used as a, as a jumping board to destroy East Pakistan, I saw myself thousands of, of so-called students traveling through India to East Pakistan, through the territory of India, and Indian government pretended not to see what was going on. They knew perfectly well, the Indian police knew it, the intelligence department of Indian government knew it, the KGB of course knew it, and the CIA knew it. That, that was most infuriating because when I defected and I explained to the CIA debriefers they should watch out because East Pakistan is going to erupt any moment. They said I, 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 was, I was reading too, too many James Bond novels. Anyway, so East Pakistan was doomed. Uh, one of my colleagues in, in the Soviet consulate in Calcutta, when he was dead drunk, he ventured into the basement to, to relieve himself and he found that big boxes which said printed matter to Dhaka University. Dhaka is the capital of East Pakistan. And since he was drunk and curious, he opened one of the boxes and he discovered not printed matter. He discovered Kalashnikov guns and ammunition in there. Anyway, it's a long story. When I saw the, the preparations for the, for the uh, invasion into East Pakistan, obviously I wanted to defect immediately. The only thing I couldn't, I couldn't at that time uh, make up my mind when and where and how. One of the reasons, of course, you see, I was in love with India. I mentioned that before. I spoke the languages. I socialized with people. And I understood that I had to, to act fast unless I want this beautiful country to be permanently and irreparably damaged by our presence. One of the reasons not to defect was, as you can see, I was living in relative affluence. Who the hell in, in, in the normal mind would defect and do what? To be abused by your media, to be called McCarthyist and fascist and paranoid, or to drive a taxi in New York City? What for? What the hell for should I defect? To be abused by, by Americans, to be insulted in exchange for, for my effort to bring the truthful information about impending danger of subversion. As you can see, I was living in quite a comfortable conditions next to swimming pool where Indians were not allowed, by the way. I was highly paid expert in propaganda. I had my family. I was respected by my nation. M my career was cloudless. The third reason, how to defect with the family. To defect with the baby and the wife would be virtual suicide because uh, according to law, 
that hypocritical law which I quoted before, the Indian police will have to hand me over back to the KGB, and that will be the end of my defection and probably my life. Again, I cannot smuggle my wife because she was not quite sure what, what I was doing. She was not that idealistically involved, and she was definitely not in, in, in the total picture of what I was doing for the KGB. She would be shocked if I, if I uh, you know, put her in my van and, and drive her to an American embassy or elsewhere. That would be a greatest danger. So again, I had to defect in such a way that my defection would look as simple disappearance. And there were many cases like that when the Soviet agents simply disappeared, either killed in action or thanks to their curiosity and, and their close contacts with radicals. Some of them were killed by the Marxists, by the way. It happened in many African countries when the Soviet KGB were killed by Africans themselves. Not because they hated Marxism-Leninism, but because they were simply a trigger-happy bunch of unruly characters. If you give them a machine gun, they will shoot. And some of the Soviets obviously were not careful enough to protect themselves, and they got into embarrassing situations when they were shot at the crossfire between factions of, of so-called liberation movements. Anyway, so I, I decided, as I said, to study the um, counterculture. I decided this probably would be the best way to disappear. I socialized with characters like this on the left. You see, he's a barefoot American hippie. Uh, it took me quite a long time to study exactly what they were doing and how to mix with them. But eventually I did it. Most of Indian newspapers carried my picture and promise of 2,000 rupees for information about my whereabouts. But they were looking for the wrong person because they obviously tried to stop a young Soviet diplomat in white shirt and tie, and th this is how I looked at the time of defection. Nobody could possibly think that the Soviet diplomat would be as crazy as to join a bunch of hippies. That's you. Tra yes, yeah. travel India and smoke hush. So I made it literally a, a, almost like a Hollywood-style um, detective story. Uh, from under the nose of the KGB in Bombay airport, I landed a plane and I flew to, to Greece where I was debriefed by the CIA. That's basically most, th that's all f for my okay, we can slides. The, we can turn off the projector, and that's very interesting. Well, you spoke several times before about ideological subversion. That is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the process which is legitimate, overt, and open. You, you can see it with your own eyes. All, all you have to do, all American mass media has to do, is to unplug their bananas from their ears, open up their eyes, and they can see it. There is no mystery. There is nothing to do with espionage. I know that espionage intelligence gathering looks more romantic. It sells more deodorants through the advertising, probably. That's why your Hollywood producers are so crazy about James Bond type of, of, of thrillers. But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of it intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriyatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology 
is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind. Even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense people who would be acting in favor and in the interests of, of, the, uh, of the United States society. And yet these people who've been programmed and, as you say, in place and yes. who are favorable to an opening with the Soviet concept, mm -hmm. these are the very people who would be marked for extermination in this country? Most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, simply because the psychological shock when, when they will see in future what the, what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, obviously they will revolt, they, 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 will, uh, they, they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. And the Marxist-Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. Uh, they, obviously they will join the links of dissenters, mm -hmm. dissidents. Yes. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in, in future Marxist-Leninist America. Uh, here you can, you can get uh, popular like uh, Daniel Ellsberg and filthy rich like Jane Fonda for being dissident, for criticizing your Pentagon. In future, these people will be simply squashed like cockroaches. Nobody is going to pay them nothing for their beautiful, noble ideas of equality. This they don't understand and uh, it will be greatest shock for them, of course. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, Actually, it's overfulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his balls, then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. So basically, America is stuck with, with demoralization. And unless, even if, if you start right now, here, this minute, you start educating new generation of Americans, it will still take you 15 to 20 years to turn the tide of, uh, of ideological perception of reality uh, back to normal, no, normalcy and... and uh, patriotism. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flabby, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation, uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials. Economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense and economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. 
Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kind of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with the benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. He will go to Moscow to kiss the bottoms of, of new generation of Soviet assassins, never mind. He will create false illusions that the uh, situation is under control. Situation is not under control. Situation is disgustingly out of control. Most of the American politicians, media, and educational system trains another generation of people who think they are living at a peace time. False. The United States is in the state of war, undeclared total war against the basic principles and the foundations of, of this system. And, and the initiator of this war is not Comrade Andropov, of course. Uh, it's, it's the system. However ridiculous it may sound, the world communist system or the world communist conspiracy, whether I scare some people or not, I don't give a hoot. Uh, if, if you are not scared by now, nothing can scare you. But you don't have to be paranoid about it. What, what actually happens now, that unlike myself, you have literally several years to live on unless the United States wake up. The, the time bomb is ticking with every second. The disaster is coming closer and closer. Unlike myself, you will have nowhere to defect to unless you want to live in Antarctica with penguins. This is it. This is the last country of freedom and, and possibility. Okay, so what do we do? What is your recommendation to the American people? Well, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the immediate thing that comes to my mind is, of course, there must be a very strong national effort to educate people in, in, in the spirit of real patriotism, number one. Number two, to, to explain them the real danger of socialist, communist, whatever, welfare state, big brother government. If people will fail to grasp the impending danger of that development, nothing ever can help the United States. You may kiss goodbye to your freedom, including freedoms to, to homosexuals, to uh, prison inmates, all this freedom will vanish, evaporate in, in five seconds, including your precious lives. Um, the second thing, I, the moment at least part of the United States population is convinced that the danger is real, they have to force their government. And I'm not talking about sending letters, signing petitions, and all this beautiful, noble activity. I'm talking about forcing United States government to stop aiding communism. Because there is no other problem more burning and, and urgent than to stop the Soviet military industrial complex from destroying what is whatever is left of the free world. And it is very easy to do. No credits, no technology, no money, no political or diplomatic recognition, and of course no such idiocy as grain deals to USSR. The Soviet people, 270 millions of, of Soviets, will be eternally thankful to you if you stop aiding a bunch of murderers who sit now in Kremlin and whom President Reagan respectfully calls government. They do not govern anything, least of all such complexity as the Soviet economy. So basic, two, two very simple, maybe two simplistic answers or solutions, but never, nevertheless, they are the only solutions. Educate yourself. Understand what's going on around you. You are not living at the time of peace. You are in a state of war. And you have precious little time to save yourself. Um, you don't have much time, especially if you are talking about young generation. There's not much time left for 
convulsions and sexual masturbation uh, uh, to the beautiful uh, disco music. Very soon it will go, just, just overnight. If we are talking about capitalists or, or, or wealthy businessmen, they, I think they are selling the rope on which they will hang very soon. If they don't stop, if they cannot curb their unsettled desire for profit, and if they keep on trading with the monster of the Soviet communism, they are going to hang very soon. And it, they will pray to be killed, but unfortunately they will be sent to Alaska probably to manage industry of slaves. It's, it's simplistic. I know it sounds unpleasant. I know Americans don't like to listen to things which are unpleasant. But I have defected not to tell you the stories about such idiocy as, as microfilm, James Bond type, espionage. This is garbage. Uh, you don't need any espionage anymore. I have come to talk about survival. It's a question of survival of this system. Um, you may ask me, what is it in for me? Survival, obviously, because unlike, I, as I said, I am now in your boat. If, if we sing together, we'll sing beautifully together. There is no other place on this planet to defect to. I was born in a military family. My father was a high-ranking officer of the Soviet Army General Staff, uh, inspector of land forces uh, stationed outside of USSR in every quote-unquote brotherly country or liberated country of the world. Uh, I graduated from Oriental Studies Institute affiliated to Moscow State University in 1963. I started working with Novosti Press Agency, the biggest propaganda and ideological subversion organization of USSR, which is directly under KGB. Ostensibly, it's a, it's a public news agency. Novosti in Russian language means news, but there are no news. It's mainly propaganda. Uh, my first job was a translator with Economical Aid Group in India. We were building refineries and, and other industrial projects in public sector, socialist sector of India. My last job was press officer of the Soviet Embassy in New Delhi. I defected in 1970, uh, came, landed in Canada, worked for several years as a producer of um, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, overseas service in, in Russian language, similar to Voice of America. Then I was teaching at uh, University of Toronto Political Science Department uh, McGill University Slavic Studies and School of Journalism Ottawa in uh, Carlton University in Ottawa. Uh, last year I uh, joined a small Russian language publishing house here in Los Angeles and now I'm a political analyst for weekly Panorama newspaper. Uh, Lumumba University language instruction was my so-called extracurricular activity, uh, which is usually given to Soviet young communists as a non-paid job to prove loyalty to the party. I was instructing students from Asia, Latin America and Africa before they entered at an ideological indoctrination uh, uh, class. Uh, it was mainly uh, Russian language instruction after which the students usually join two-year or three-year extensive course in Marxist-Leninist ideo ideological indoctrination, plus their own sub uh, subjects of, of their choice, uh, medicine, physics, uh, chemistry, whatever. Uh, if, they, if after uh, five or six years studying, they, they are pr proven to be, well, flexible, loyal, uh, cynical enough to follow the Soviet foreign policy, they are being transferred to a KGB school for, t for, the, uh, for a period of two years, after which they are being dispatched back to their native countries and become so-called sleepers, uh, uh, the word from, originated from sleeping. For several years they sleep in their own countries doing nothing. Sometimes they are pursuing their own careers, they become lawyers, doctors, uh, teachers, um, taxi drivers, barbers. And they spring into action after many years of destabilization of their own countries as Soviet agents. Therefore, all of a sudden you discover uh, well-established lawyers in, in a country like Nicaragua, who are, for some strange reason are 
bitterly against quote-unquote American imperialism and idealistically for Soviet uh, Marxist-Leninist imperialism. Uh, I joined Novosti Press Agency uh, before I graduated from the Oriental Studies Institute where I studied Hindi and Urdu, two languages of Indian subcontinent. Urdu is the language of Pakistan and Hindi is the language of India. The journalistic part of my training was ordinary journalism, mass media, uh, uh, communication theories and, and studies. Together with that, we had a very extensive training in uh, military, civil defense, intelligence, and ideological subversion. So even before I graduated, I started working with Novosti Press Agency, first as a translator, interpreter, and guide with foreign delegations who were invited to USSR and who were shown all the beauties of socialism and dispatched back to their countries to explain to, uh, to their uh, uh, people how beautiful is socialism. Uh, my role was directly linked with KGB activities of, of brainwashing and psychological assessment of these guests. If they showed any sign of flexibility, which means uh, they showed that they were recruitable, uh, I passed them over to professional KGB recruiters and from there on they were actively being involved in ideological subversion and propaganda, both in USSR and in their own countries. Well, the decision, of, of course, was very painful and, and difficult. But on the other hand, I didn't have any illusions or illusions about the Soviet system and, and communist or socialist system. It's the most rotten and unworking system in the world. Uh, some people call it state capitalism, socialism, centralized planning, whatever. It doesn't really matter what kind of name you attach to the system. Basically, if you are a religious person, it's a devilish satan satanistic system which appeals only to the most primitive, negative side of human nature. Uh, it's the, the basis of that system is denial of private property, human dignity, and, and personal responsibility, and of course, any religion, uh, religious affiliation of a human being to God as a supreme being. Uh, my dissatisfaction, disillusionment, if you, if you can call it, because I never was illusioned uh, 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 with, this, with the communism, started as early as um, age, from age six, I guess. Uh, the first shock uh, was after the Second World War, uh, when most of the children of my age understood that United States is the friend uh, with whom together uh, Soviet people defeated Nazism, German fascism, all of a sudden turned into an enemy uh, and all of a sudden the propaganda turned 180 degrees around and we were brainwashed in the spirit of hatred to everything which is American. But how could you explain to a child of six years old who owes his survival to American spam condensed milk, egg powder, and things which you probably people never remember because nobody eats them these days. Spam meat, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> How can you explain to them that these delicious things came from an enemy who wants to subvert and destroy us? It's impossible because the child remembers when he was hungry, he was eating spam and, and drinking condensed American uh, milk with the American eagle on the on the label. So all the efforts of the Soviet propaganda to convince me that America is bad was futile, naturally. That was the first shock. The second was this 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party when Khrushchev revealed the atrocities of Stalin terrorism and um, murder, systematic murder of millions of innocent people. That was another greatest shock. Uh, and the third shock, of course, when I was already grown up, a, a student, invasion into Czechoslovakia in 1968, that was the last point. Uh, and when I was in India acting as a Soviet official, a Soviet diplomat, I understood that sooner or later I have to defect and to explain what exactly I was doing in India. I fell in love with that country because um, at that time this country didn't do any harm to any neighbors, least of all to the Soviet Union. And yet we did so much harm to that country that I decided to defect and explain it, first to Indians, then to American 
politicians, intelligence communities and media. Unfortunately, I didn't have much success because my stories were treated with a great skepticism. I was called paranoid, McCarthyist, fascist, Cold War maniac and other names which I don't want to mention here. And um, it took me quite a number of years to understand that I'm talking to people who are trying to prevent average American from knowing the truth about communism. The basic methods are not that much different from activities of any public relation officer from any big company, say Coca-Cola, I bet. They have their own department of, person, of public relations and press relations. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose is different. If Coca-Cola wants to make profit and to sell more Coca-Cola to nations of the world, the Soviet Union, the ultimate purpose of the Soviet system is not to sell anything, least of all ideology, is to destroy the civilization on which uh, the affluence and freedom based and replace it with a system of total control over life of human beings the system of total exploitation that's the, the ultimate purpose Can, uh, my specific measures which which I was forced to do unwillingly of course but I had to do them just to promote myself further and further is uh, bribery corruption uh, befriending politicians members of parliament influential uh, scholars uh, members of civil service, businessmen. In other words, anyone who has any um, anything to do with shaping of public opinion in the interests of the Soviet foreign policy. Uh, that would include a long process which sometimes is unnoticeable to an average person. It's a long-term process which is called so, uh, uh, ideological subversion. It's unnoticeable as movement of a small hand of a clock. You know it's going around, but even if you watch it in intensely, you, you don't see the movement. The eventual result is uh, befriending these people and trying to get them involved in, in the activity in the interests of the Soviet foreign policy. The immediate impulse when I learned that the Soviet Embassy Department of Research and Counter Propaganda, of which I was a deputy chief, is engaged neither in research nor in counter propaganda. It is a department which is compiling information of private nature on individuals divided in two groups, good boys and bad boys. The sympathetic people were promoted in media and, and public life. Uh, the people who were opposed to the Soviet foreign policy were blackwashed, blackmailed, and, and, and destroyed, first morally and, and sometimes physically too. Uh, understanding of what I was doing came to me when I, when I looked through a press release of United States Information Service describing an incident in a South Vietnamese city of Hue, captured by communists from Hanoi for, for 48 hours. Then it was recaptured by United States and South, South Vietnamese armies and to their horror they discovered that within two nights the communists could manage to round up more than 15,000 people and execute them. Uh, most of these people were either sympathetic to United States or to the Western culture or directly involved uh, in, in activities uh, uh, supporting United States president in South Vietnam, agents of CIA naturally, even barbers because they know too much. They were executed and United States intelligence couldn't figure out how could they possibly do it in such short period of time. Later on they discovered, uh, they found out from several defectors that long before communists occupied that city uh, there was an extensive omnipresent network of informers who knew exactly the addresses, the names, the whereabouts of each individual who was later executed. When I turned to my own files, I discovered that basically that information exists in my department. So it doesn't take much intelligence to understand what I was doing in India. I was compiling information. Comes revolution, these people would be executed. Indirectly, I was involved in, in, a, in a criminal activity, in, in mass murder. I decided to defect and explain it to Americans, and the uh, response I already described, I was called a paranoid. But I decided to defect and try nevertheless. 
There's another long story. It's virtually impossible to defect in India simply because Indian government, under pressure from the Soviet government, if you can call them government, I don't call them government, I call them junta. Uh, they adopted a law as early as, as, as in 61 or 62, after, after Stalin's daughter defection especially. That law states that no embassy, no, no foreign uh, uh, legation on the territory of Indian Republic has a right to extend political asylum to any defector from any country, which is very, it's, it's a masterpiece of hypocrisy. No other defector but a Soviet one needs a political asylum. Uh, if you are a Canadian or American, if you want to be nasty to your own government, the maximum you can do is just to pick up a phone and, and make a dirty phone call to your ambassador. <laughs> Buy yourself a ticket and get lost. <laughs> what, what happens to a Soviet defector in, under that law? If I knock a door of, of United States Embassy, by that law, the American diplomats have to turn me back to the Indian police and Indian police takes me back directly back to the Soviet embassy and that's the end of, of my uh, defection. So knowing that perfectly well and having contacts both with Indian police and American uh, media corps, I, I understood that the only way for me was to disappear for a while and the best way I discovered was to mix with a group of hippies. Mind you, that, that was the time <laughs> I, I was 13 years younger, so I looked slightly different, of course. I, uh, I studied so-called counterculture in India. Uh, sometimes uh, good, sincere young people who wanted to study oriental mysticism and culture and religion but most of them were simply easygoing individuals who were delighted with exotic, exotic life and, and um, the easiness with which they can purchase hashish and, and other drugs in India. And sometimes they traveled Indian subcontinent without any identification papers. So the best way to, to uh, escape detection was to mix with the group of hippies and travel in India uh, until the campaign in the media and, and in the police, uh, the police search will subside. All the newspapers in India carried my picture and uh, announcement of the police uh, that anyone coming forward with information about my whereabouts would receive 5,000 or 2,000 rupees. Knowing that perfectly well, I just walked in there barefoot with beads and blue jeans, smoking hush and um, enjoying life until I found sympathetic journalists who smuggled me from India to Greece. Mind you, that was a military dictatorship at that time. Then only I approached uh, American CIA and they helped me to uh, land in Canada as a legit uh, ordinary uh, immigrant. So now I'm a Canadian citizen. As you can see from my patriotic type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Canada is a kind of middle of the, way, uh, of the road country where uh, there are so many various ethnic groups that another uh, strange character who speaks both Russian and, and English and two oriental languages, did, did, I, I, I didn't have any problem uh, fitting into academic circles and first being just a student at the University of Toronto and later a producer with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I think it was successful, and until and unless the, there'll be follow-up to that uh, movie, uh, it will remain as as a as an open wound in in United States as a scare tactic, uh, which in this particular case I'm not sure whether KGB paid for production of that movie or not. But it's totally irrelevant. What is the most important, unless after seeing the tragic sequences of, of the uh, uh, nuclear attack, uh, American population is not explained what to do about it. If you still stop at that and l let it be, obviously, th this is the scare tactic, this is the greatest harm done to United States by, by Americans, by American filmmaker. I bet a drop of an all his disinformation uh, system could not, could not possibly do that much harm to the United States. When, when you see something obviously sponsored by the Soviets, uh, you understand, well, this is propaganda. You may or may not agree with this depending on your 
background and, uh, and, and intelligence and education. But here it's a subtle approach, uh, playing on the most sensitive strings of your soul, appealing to, to the most basic instincts of, of, of human nature, survival. But there, there are no answers. How to survive? Well, obviously, disarmament is not the answer. Uh, simply because some people naively expect a drop of to blush uh, out of shame and reduce the number of warheads. Uh, it doesn't happen this way. This, we are facing unresponsive, irresponsible group of people for whom uh, nuclear war is not a theory, it's a practice, and the, the military strategy of the Soviet Union is designed to, to do nuclear war and to survive and possibly to win. I, I, was, I started my military training when I was six or seven years old, when I, when I entered secondary school. And I graduated in 63 after almost 15 years of continuous training as a junior lieutenant of reserve of the Soviet Army. And uh, psychologically, every Soviet citizen is well prepared for, for, for war, nuclear war. And uh, technically, he is equipped with facilities and the knowledge how to use it in case of war or, or natural disaster. It doesn't matter. Survival tactics and survival um, methods are taught extensively in, in various manners, they, they, they are exposed to documentary movies about nuclear war. They know the, the technical data of, of radiation or, or contamination of, of air and, and land. They know the organizational patterns of, of civil defense to such an extent that even if there is no nuclear attack, even if there is conventional uh, warfare, each individual at, at a certain time knows exactly where to go, what to do, where is the shelter, uh, whom to call by telephone, uh, which is not the case unfortunately in the United States. I think if, if a bomb, ordinary bomb, bomb, maybe a stink bomb is dropped in the middle of Los Angeles, most of the people will not die of uh, atomic radiation, they will die of panic, they will, they will run and uh, the traffic jams and, 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 and the Panic will kill more people than, than any, anything else. And where do they go? Is, is, is there any literature about how to protect an individual? Is the medical first aid treatment? It, it's not taught to, to, to kids in the American colleges, unfortunately. For example, there's obvious uh, tension in the world. Uh, t television newscasts. Um, inform American family about happenings in, in uh, East and West Germany and only at the last moment they decide to bring the canned food down to the basement. <laughs> it's a sheer idiocy. Why not to have them in the basement at, the, at peacetime? Uh, number two, there's, there's very realistic picture of what happens uh, when the first nuclear bomb strikes uh, a big city, Kansas City, I think. And people uh, a, a big panoramic uh, picture shows almost an ant hill when you know people are disoriented totally. That would produce laugh in Russia because unlike that, Soviets know exactly what to do. There'll well, there'll be much less panic if, if, if at all. Uh, I I know about infiltration of KGB into peace movement probably as much as an average. Uh, American who reads newspapers uh, systematically, but uh, I'm obviously I, I'm aware that the World Peace Council is is a front organization of, of the KGB. Ramesh Chandra I know personally, both in India and USSR. I wor worked with delegations of of um, various peaceniks who came to the World Congress of, 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 of Peace Council in Moscow. I think it was in 1961 or 62. Yeah, it was before Cuban crisis. And uh, at that time, they struck me as, as people who are pathologically unable to see the truth, uh, not to talk about the, the military aspects. When I, when, as a translator and, and a guide, I used to take them to places in Moscow which are not supposed to be for foreigners' eyes. 
uh, they didn't want to see it. Uh, they had their preconceived ideas. They, they were suffering f from self-importance. They thought it's, it's a great honor to sit in the Kremlin, in the palace of, of Congresses, next to, a, next to a debil from Kremlin, and, uh, you know, talk about peace as if uh, that person from Politburo means anything in, in peace movement. Self-delusion is, is the most predominant phenomenon among these people. Ramesh Chandra is, is a very shrewd politician who takes advantage of naive, misguided, idealistically minded, sometimes sincere people. Uh, but he is, I, I, I would, my impression is that he's totally sold himself to the Soviets. He receives his payments or royalties or whatever you can call it in the form of prizes. Of course, it's very embarrassing if you, if, you, if you approach a person of his caliber with money, with cash, and say, here, Comrade Ramesh Chandra, there is money for your propaganda uh, in the interests of the Soviet Union. It's very impolite. So instead, the Soviet Union creates artificial international bodies, such as Jawaharlal Nehru Peace Committee, which consists of various progressive leaders, writers, uh, sometimes they're the known figures and uh, philosophers, educationalists. Uh, sometimes they probably feel that if there's no other possibility to express the de desire for peace, at least there is some legitimate overt activity where they can express themselves. That's okay. And they think they are too smart not to see that uh, part of it is Soviet propaganda. They're, okay, we are smart. We are not going to allow them to use us for propaganda purposes. This is wishful thinking, because after five or six visits, visits to USSR, everything is paid by the Soviet uh, government. After spending several vacations on the Black Sea coast, in luxurious atmosphere with two or three nice girls, interpreters, lots of vodka and caviar, books published, Rapid books, which nobody reads in the United States, all of a sudden published in millions of copies in the USSR in various languages that tickles their ego. They think they are some, somebody's all of a sudden. It's difficult to resist the temptation. Ramesh Chandra is exactly that type of personality. He was approached at, at, at a very early stage, uh, and uh, he didn't have willpower and moral principles to resist the temptation, to resist the approach. And by now he's, he's just a pawn in the game, high-ranking pawn. And um, uh, if he is dis dismissed or dies natural death, there will be another the, the line of people who would like to take his place. Yes, KGB takes very active part in the, in the peace movement. Uh, and if these people were sincere as they say they are, they would start demonstrating in Kremlin, or I mean in Red Square, not in Washington DC or in, in, in the Central Park in New York or in Los Angeles. But they don't have courage, they don't have guts to go to Russia and protest against the nuclear armament of the Soviet Union. Therefore, I agree that they are misguided, but I think they are cowards. They are unprincipled, dishonest people. And there's no justification that they are misguided or poorly informed. It's their fault that they're poorly informed. There's enough information, there's enough possibility. In case of United States citizens, there's enough freedom to do what their consciousness should tell them to do. Go to Russia and protest against armament. It doesn't take much courage to, 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 to take part in demonstration in Los Angeles. But if you are really genuinely concerned about peace, tell it to Brezhnev, tell it to Andropov, and we'll see how courageous and sincere you are. They don't do it. Well, the greatest strength, I think, is, is uh, uh, the, the basic principle of American democracy, common sense, and the, uh, the value of, of of the principles of private property and, and, and respect to human dignity and, and indivi individual rights. The weakness is the permissiveness and lack of moral stamina, which 
if you are a religious person, could be, could be interpreted as probably alienation from religion, alienation from God. Thinking too much in materialistic terms, thinking in short span of time for pragmatic advantages, disregarding the perspective of civilization. Some philosopher, I forget his name, I'm, I was a bad student in Moscow, said that the level of civilization is in direct proportion to the time span that human being thinks in, in future, for future. The least civilized people live today, this minute. The more civilized nations think about tomorrow, 10 years from now, 100 years from now. Oh, this is one of the definitions of... Unfortunately, Americans are made to think in shorter and shorter time span terms. This is the greatest weakness. So therefore, enjoy life and make love, not war. I, th I think that willpower and revitalization of traditional moral values and principles is the most desirable thing now, today, the, the sooner the better. The things that the principles and values on which the affluence and success of American civilization depends and, and based upon should be immediately civil, uh, uh, revitalized and brought back to school programs, to media, and let's face it, propaganda. I'm not afraid of this word, unlike the uh, left liberal journalists who think, oh, well, it's propaganda. I don't see anything wrong in propagating the basic moral principles and values on which America is built. Willpower, faith, unshakable faith that this country, this civilization is right and the enemy is wrong. No amount or no number of nuclear warheads and, and no size of the army will, will help United States to survive, whether there is nuclear war or conventional warfare. Vietnam proved very clearly that with all the technology, with all the supersonic bombers and napalm and whatnot, electronic gadgets and, and cold beer and Coca-Cola, you cannot defeat an enemy unless you are fighting and have faith in the righteousness of your fight. So that's the most urgent thing, I think. Wake up and, and, and convince yourself that you are on the right side. There should not be no neutralism or object objectivity. Or objectivity is good when you are discussing philosophical concepts. In today's world, if you are neutral, you are already an enemy of your own country. You have to actively take part of your country, your side. One of the reasons of my defection is that I took side. I was, I was decided to take part, to take choice, to make my own personal choice. For some strange reason today, it's very fashionable, it's considered to be an intellectual shift not to take sides. Academic media, must, uh, uh, academic circles, uh, Hollywood stars, uh, politicians, they think it's very fashionable, it's intellectual to be non-allied, non-committed, uh, neutral. It's, it's, it's not intellectual, it's suicidical. <laughs> Suicidal. <laughs> okay, I'll start with, this, with a short explanation. I'm going to show you some slides now. The things that you're going to see, uh, there's nothing new actually. They're, they're reproductions from various media organs in the United States, USSR. Probably you see these pictures hundred times a day. Uh, I'm going to give you a, very, a, a different viewpoint on the same things, same facts that you see and probably don't, don't take much trouble to un understand and think what you are seeing. Uh, I don't know if you heard my uh, in introduction. I, I, I'm an ideological subverter, yes, from Russia. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's the idea of showing the slides to you is just to provoke 
questions in your mind, and later on, if you still have patience with me, I, I will explain how exactly the system of ideological in, indoctrination and um, um, uh, subversion works. Well, we know that we are living in a time of peace, and we know that recent uh, walkout from the Geneva talks by the Soviets uh, is centered around the nuclear arms and rockets. We don't see much about the Soviet preparedness, the Soviet viewpoint on the military strategy. Well, this is a selection of pictures, only pictures. Confucius said that one picture tells more than a thousand words. These pictures are from everyday newspapers in USSR. This is what the Soviet citizen looks, uh, in, uh, looks upon every day. Uh, basically, this is a, a militaristic spirit, a, a pictures of, of foreign delegates observing the rockets passing the Red Square. The idea of invasion, unlike in the United States, is not being criticized by the Soviet media at all. Uh, on the contrary, it's being forcefully encouraged from the age of, say, five or six years, six year old. Every Soviet student's, uh, uh, student or schoolboy has to go through military training. Uh, this is uh, a picture from a um, special military school where young kids, well, maybe four or five years old, are being trained to be future officers of the Soviet army. That's what they do when they grow up. These are the Soviet sailors, Navy uh, uh, officers in a foreign country. We criticize a lot uh, American presence in foreign countries, but we never criticize and we never pay too much attention about these planes landing with uh, ammunition and firearms in, say, countries like Ethiopia. Uh, these are the pictures in Time magazine, which probably you've seen and then forgotten about it. These are the Soviet tanks on foreign territory. Are there any protest demonstrations in uh, uh, Los Angeles or uh, New York City? No. These are the Soviet military advisors. Nobody tells them Russians go home. How it starts, the media obviously plays a, a great role. This is a political cartoon from a Western newspaper. Um, you see, it was published sometimes after the Second World War. These four columns of peace pay attention to whom they are being erected. Roosevelt on the left, Churchill on the right, and Stalin in the middle. A peacemaker, Stalin. Okay, this is another thing. Chicago Tribune, January 1945. Destiny's Child, New Year, 45, is born. Look who is looking with, with love and affection. Churchill, Roosevelt, Chiang Kai-shek, and Stalin. And this is how the Soviet media describes Churchill as a warmonger. Iskustvo, Moscow, 1951. This is how the Soviet media presents American militarism linked with Nazism. This is how the Soviet media uh, illustrates South African colonialism, not much different from a political cartoon in New York Times or Los Angeles Times. As a matter of fact, almost similar. Growth of inflation due to military uh, expenses. A political cartoon from Pravda newspaper. It could be published as it is in Los Angeles Times. Nobody would wonder. NATO is criticized by the Soviet media, but so it is by the American media. Law and order justifying the former military criminals. This picture. This is what a uh, this, this is a number of books which I selected in a, a, an average university bookstore. Most of them are left-wing propaganda. Eric Fromm, May Men Prevail, the Indochina story, of course, from the viewpoint of left. Lenin's work, How to Deal with Communists by um, uh, a former ambassador to USSR. Um, um, Marx and Engels, Lenin, Ro uh, Herbert Marcuse. Uh, the communist movement. These are the books which are included in the uh, list of reading for a, an average student of political science department in any college of Canada or United States. These are the books which are on sale in United States and Canada. Soviet propaganda. These are the booklets and magazines published by Novosti Press Agency, for which I worked for 12 years. 
No restriction for these booklets. I found them in the, on the campus of Toronto University. Most, half of these books I edited myself when I was working for Novosti in Moscow. <laughs> This is a very interesting thing. It doesn't say much unless I explain what it is. These are the seals attached to crates of books imported from USSR to Montreal. As you can easily see, the seal is unbroken, which means that the customs in Canada didn't bother to see what's inside. And as I know from my personal experience, we used to import machine guns AK-47 and ammunition through India to Bangladesh in exactly the same crates sign printed matter to Dhaka University. This is what editor of Time magazine suggests you to read at the time of invasion, I mean uh, uh, fall of uh, Southeast Asia to communists. Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago is on the bottom of the list according to the editor's choice. Why on bottom of the list. These are the books which are never included in the list of compulsory reading to any, uh, in any university or college in the United States uh, or Canada. Look what the student is missing. The death of Stalin, childhood in prison, ferment in Ukraine, Russian secret service, the great terror. These are the books which for some strange reason Americans are denied the freedom and right to read. Why America is in global retreat? Have you ever seen this book on, on a campus? No, of course not. I know that. Anthony Sutton, National Suicide. Have you ever had a chance to read that book? Oh, you had? Well, good. <laughs> this is another very interesting thing. A description how drugs penetrate into Western society originated in communist world for some strange reason that textbook is never included in, in the list of compulsory, compulsory reading for students of political science or international affairs. This is the book written by a former member of communist party in Czechoslovakia explaining the tactics of subversion. For some strange reason it was not published in the United States or Canada. The author had to pay for the publication himself after defecting to, to the West. This is another interesting example. Exoneration, an ultimatum re, uh, written by Richard Romer, a science fiction novel about invasion of United States into Canada to expropriate the oil and natural gas resources in that neighboring friendly nation. Why it took invasion, I don't understand. 51 or more percent of the uh, the companies are already belong to United States in Canada, as probably you know already. Who is the author? Richard Romer is a dynamic and dedicated ex exponent of the needs of potential. And so, anyway, he's a friend of Pierre Trudeau, a former, <laughs> a, a, a former uh, military officer. And what he writes is, is, is something that Andropov probably would be very happy about. He describes a situation when the only thing that saves Canada from United States military occupation is a call from Andropov to the President of United States threatening him with the, re uh, with the reply or the, uh, the military answer to an invasion of Canada by United States. And this is written by a close friend of Pierre Trudeau, a politician, a former military man. Why? Is he a paranoid or am I a paranoid? <laughs> These are the three books published almost simultaneously, uh, sometimes in the middle of 70s, CIA and the Cult of Intelligence, CIA Diary by Philip Age, and the KGB by John Barron. I tried to buy the KGB, but it was not in the bookstores of Canada or United States. The previous two books on the left were. This is the author of the, of the most anti-American book, The Defector to the Communist Side, Philip H. He is alive. Nobody is threatening his life. Nobody is poisoning him with, with the poison umbrella. This is, uh, you know who? Uh, he is criticizing CIA for developing a gun to kill communist agents. And he tries to present it as a crime on behalf of United States Intelligence Agency. Why is it a crime? 
to defend you from the communist agents and to develop a secret gun which is silent is a crime. Is there any logic? I, I don't see any. This is the fellow who also criticizes the, the United States CIA for developing technical means of bugging United, I mean, USSR embassies on the territory of the United States. Why not? I don't see any reason why not. But Mondale obviously does. He knows better. These are the authors who published lists of, of American agents stationed all over the world. They are alive. They, they, they actually, they, they make quite a lot of money in that publication. And this is the victim. The uh, chief of CIA in brief was killed when the book of, of the previous two Americans was, was published. This fellow is dead. The other two are not. Siberia in 1971 was visited by a group of politicians from Canada. <clears throat> and this, this is the report about that visit. This is uh, the group who are shaking hands with the Soviet uh, ambassador. This is a Soviet technical miracle. A pipeline on thermo, uh, 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 thermofrost or something. In other words, what Canadians were doing in early 60s is presented to Canadian public as an achievement, a great technological achievement in USSR. This is the root of their travel in Siberia. The Canadians covered that much of distance. Please remember that map. I will come back to that question. This is a book published by a Canadian author, Farley Mowat. By the way, Never Cry Wolf, a movie which is uh, made on the basis of uh, Farley Mowat's book. He's a nice fellow, drinks a lot of vodka. He was a guest of Novosti Press Agency, which I was working for. This is another book written by Farley Mowat after returning from Siberia. He was accompanied by a person like myself, a Novosti Press Agency journalist. Glorification of Siberia. This is what an oh, this is the route. I promised you to come back to that map, which Farley Mowat, a Canadian progressive writer, covered when he was in USSR. This is what he makes Canadians to believe Siberia looks like. It does, of course. Baikal Lake is a very beautiful natural phenomenon. And a nicely dressed Soviet Eskimos or Chukchas, I don't know, some ethnic minorities, friendly talking to each other in fluent English. <laughs> the, the uh, nice, nice motel somewhere in the middle of Siberia. <laughs> uh, huge hydroelectric, uh, electrical projects. It is true, it is built, but they never mentioned by whom. And this is what I eventually wanted to show you. These are the two routes. First one in red ink by Canadian government delegation, in blue ink by the author Farley Mowat, accompanied by Novosti Press Agency. The black dots are locations of Soviet concentration camps. These people were shown the places where the slave labor is being used by the Soviet government, if you call them government. I call them junta of mass murderers. But there is not a single mentioning, not a word, that those beautiful electric stations were built by slave, slave labor. This is what Canadian reader will never see in the report by Canadian politicians or the progressive writer Farley Mowat. You say, well, that's, that's Russia. This is not a kindergarten. This is a prison for children of prisoners. These are the houses. If, if, if an American contractor would build a house like that, I think he will end up in jail. But this is what, what is being shown to, to some naive foreigners as achievements of Soviet technology. Naturally, if you follow the editor's choice and advice, you will never understand that the description, the, the, the most detailed description of Soviet concentration camp system is put on the, on the bottom of the list. You say, well, maybe in USSR the concentration camp is nothing surprising. Well, this is a concentration camp in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia. Same thing. Slave labor. 
This is what happens to slave laborers when they don't obey the orders. They are being executed, not by firing squad, because bullets are too expensive, by shovels, crushing skulls. This is the victory of communism for you. This is what happens to their children. And this is the originator of this slot house, Cambodian Premier Pol Pot, during interview with Time magazine. Very nice, plump, fatherly image. You are made to believe that Holocaust happened during the Second World War is something that may happen again. It may, but the originator of it may not necessarily be the Nazis. We don't have any Nazi submarines roaming around the shores of the United States and Canada. We have liberation forces. That's what Holocaust. This is happening right now after the so-called National Liberation Movement. This is a, a, is a still from a movie, Holocaust, a television production. The Nazis are shooting the prisoners, the Jews. We are made to... Well, it's horrible, of course, there's no denial. It happened many years ago. And the tactic, which I will explain you later, if, if you have patience with me, is sidetracking your opinion from present danger to the past. From this. This is present time. This is past time. This is happening right now in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Is there any movie about Holocaust which happens now? No. This is what happens in the... For, uh, well, it did happen in Rhodesia before it becomes Zimbabwe. It's a black girl, by the way, not a white one. This is the uh, result of the socialist movement. These people were killed by those who are now in power in Zimbabwe. And we call them reverend bishops or whatever. This is the supply of Soviet arms to Rhodesia before it turned into Zimbabwe. And this is a very interesting picture. A poor South African is showing his internal passport, saying that there's no freedom and he has to live wherever he is assigned to live by the police. For some strange reason, not a single media outlet in the United States makes a comparison because in Russia every citizen have a passport like that. And the Asian ethnics in USSR do not have the right to live in those areas which are designed for the, for the whites and the other way around. But we are getting emotional about this passport. Why not about Soviet passport? The answer is, is flowing in the wind how the Okay, the, the feeling of guilt. Open any magazine. There are lots of pictures like that. Hungry people asking for your dollar. Donation. Think about it. Emma de Leon has no one else to turn to except you. See how many pictures? I collected them within one week. And who helps them? Rock stars. Through United Nations UNICEF. And how they use this money? They buy arms. Have you noticed that countries like Philippines never ask for donations? Why? Because they have free market system. Oh yes, they have military dictatorship, oppression of civil rights. But for some strange reason, only those countries which are already liberated by Marxists are asking for your donations. Why? And when they get these donations, will you be my friend? This is what Time magazine wants you to think. If not, the implication is this is what's going to happen. Powesi, when white miners stationed in this small country, African country, were murdered by so-called National Liberation Movement, this is the result. Rape and murder after your donations. And who is, who is supporting these movements? Of course, United Nations. Okay, we'll, we'll come later on to the question of semantic manipulation. Everybody knows that United Nations is not united and it's not nation. But we continue to call them. I don't know how many people notice the striking similarity between the sim um, emblem of United Nations and emblem of, this, of the USSR. You think it's coincidence? 
The symbolism is obvious, unless you are blind, of course. Yeah. And the creator of the United Na Nations Charter is um, an American alger his standing next to Comrade Molotov sitting there on the left. We know he was a Soviet spy, but he is at large now. Alger, he is, he is a lawyer, a respected citizen of the United States, a former Soviet spy. Well, you know, this guy is a Daniel Ellsberg. He published secret papers of Pentagon. Why not of Soviet military industrial complex? He is a respected citizen of the United States. It's Dr. Spock, agony of Vietnam. Uh, I forget what's his name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how, ma how many men has to die before they understand? The f I don't remember the, the, the lyrics of the song, but it was a very impressive song. When I was a Soviet student, I almost cried when I listened to that. And I thought, my God, what a nice fella. John Baez, very nice couple of kids. Jane Fonda, she was crying on location in Vietnam, beautifully filmed by American Hollywood uh, correspondent, I mean, uh, filmmakers. What is she doing now? Did she ever defend both people? Did she say a word in defense of the Vietnamese? Or say about horrors of, of coming out of this? No, she's busy uh, preaching the health or whatever. <laughs> and also, she takes part in demonstration against South, Amer uh, South African racism. Not about this. And not about this. This is Liberation Movement Warriors. Jane Fonda didn't say anything about that racism. A black killed by blacks, simply because he is anti-communist. That's just a symbolic picture. Okay, now next thing, I'm going to show you some slides which are also not nothing sensational, but may provoke some questions in your mind. Maybe not. Okay. The more questions you have, the better, because we'll, we'll come to systematic explanation of, of the phenomenon later. Now I want you just to get excited. Uh, Hollywood actress talking to Fidel Castro. Nothing wrong, of course. Depends what is the message or what's the subject of talking. I, I bet you never heard about this fella. He's an American singer, Dean Reed. He's singing in Moscow for some strange reason. And you know what he's singing about? Oppression, civil rights uh, in, in, in USA, and about poor Americans who cannot survive. Well, I don't want to be too critical of, of uh, uh, Pope, of uh, Catholic Church, but some state statements which he made at the earlier uh, years of his um, uh, becoming a, a pontiff of Catholic Church, strikingly unpleasant to me. Communism and church can coexist. Can they? Well, you should ask uh, 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 Russian Orthodox priests who were literally <laughs> exterminated by, by the Soviet communists. Communism and church can coexist. I don't think so. Catholic Times. I, I collected this newspaper in a Catholic church, which I attend, although I'm, I'm Orthodox Christian, as uh, Russians, most of them are. But I do come to Catholic Church because my wife is a Catholic, so I don't see much difference because God, I suppose, is one. So Jesus Christ is also the same, which church, whichever you go. But Christians and socialism is something that doesn't really appeal to me. I don't know how about you. <laughs> Social justice central to gospel, is it? I never heard about it. Join with Marxists? It's from the same newspaper. 
And that's how they joined the Marxists. Nicaragua, before Sandinista came to power, a priest with machine gun behind his back. And the machine gun, of course, Kalashnikov, if you know anything about machine guns. Okay, then there are some strange deviations from religious uh, um, path. Uh, what's his name? John, Jim, Jim Jones. Wow. Reverend. Reverend? Nice looking guy with adopted kids and uh, shaking hands with a politician, Mayor George Moscone in 1976. Very nice. That's how it all ended, you remember. 900, more than 900 people who poisoned themselves together with their kids in Guyana. This is a very interesting picture, it's not very clear. Instead of Jesus Christ, they put a naked lady, you know, in, in the church. Strange, huh? Eh? Of course it's strange. Crucifix of a woman for Palm Sunday. Boy, Jesus Christ would turn in his grave if he were in grave. <laughs> now this, this is something that also indicates some strange occurrences within the framework of organized religion. In Struggle, a paper with hammer and sickle, published by a Canadian group of uh, Trotskyites, very dynamic, extremely radical group. They challenged the question, whose democracy is this? Meaning that Canadian democracy is not democracy at all, simply because that radical group is challenged by the local police. Right? So nothing new, we know about this. But look, where this paper is being distributed. Political repression. Friday, October, uh, United Church. Strange, eh? See, this is the same leaflet. Enlarged. This is another thing. President Carter handed over a, an antique crown belonged to Church of Hungary, to the present communist regime of, of Hungary. Why? I don't understand. To make them friendly to church? I doubt. Feminist movement. I don't know how you feel about feminism. I don't think that to be equal with men, you have to politicize your movement. You cannot legislate equality. You have to be equal. But that distracts your mind from real issues of family, loyalty and, 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 well, if you feel moral, moral foundations, and they make a great political capital on that. First Lady of the United States sitting to, the, to, to some kind of, I forget what, what her name was, exposing her tits to the media. I mean, this is, and by, by, the, so, by, by the American media standards, this is something normal, acceptable. A First Lady of the United States together with the lady who burns her uh, uh, bra? Uh, I don't know. Well, ladies in the army, of course, I don't know what's your opinion. I, I never heard about girls in the Soviet army, especially in, in the uh, infantry force, simply because when they have period, that's, that may create a problem for invasion of, say, Afghanistan. <laughs> Again, the uh, homosexualism. I, I, to be honest, me personally, I, I don't like the idea of homosexuality. I think it's it's unhygienic. But, <laughs> but uh, homosexuality in the army, making heroes of them, gays on the march. Why? Why to to have copulation in a natural ma manner deserves a public opinion uh, attention? And, and, and a political force? Why to politicize something which doesn't belong to politics at all? In Russian, uh, in the Soviet Union, we have a joke. Don't mix politics and prostitution. They are already mixed. <laughs> we know perfectly well, this, the medical science proved that homosexuality leads to distortion in, in uh, human psychology. This fellow killed 15 kids after molesting them sexually. We know that most of the agents who were recruited by KGB, including McLean and, and, and Guy Burgess, were homosexual, homosexuals. But we are 
reading in, in the media that this is some, something acceptable. More than that, we are made to believe that these people deserve equal rights and respect. Well, that again is a debatable question, whether to like or not to like certain type of music. Me personally, I don't. This, these two nice ladies, one is younger, the other is a little bit older, both of them wanted, for some strange reason, to shoot President of the United States, defending the environment of the United States, the green trees and uh, vegetation. Why it takes that of United States President to defend the, the, the environment, I, I don't understand. If you do, please explain. Um, then, of course, glorifying all kind of national liberation leaders, we naturally provoke our own kids to go into some strange liberation movement. You know who I'm talking about. This is the girl who was abducted by terrorists, and then she became terrorist herself, a daughter of a wealthy publisher. Naturally, there are thousands, millions of kids who, who loved, adored her courage, this is Comrade Carlos, you know who he was. He was trained and educated in Lumumba University, where I was teaching Russian language to the likes of him. That's the result of the activity when they come back home. Aldo Moro was killed by Red Army terrorists who wanted to liberate Italians from something. I don't know from whom. These are the, the, the persons who were part of Bader Meinhof gang. And this is a person who also liberates someone from someone. I don't exactly know, obviously, Indians from whites in, in the United States. But pay attention what he holds in his hand. It's Kalashnikov, AK-47. I know it by heart. I can put it apart with my eyes closed. Um, war on terrorism. Does it exist? Apart from verbal war. This is what I have collected on an A campus in Canada, Carleton University, Ottawa. Left-wing tabloids, that's how they instill in the minds of people, young people, that to fight is the only way, the violence, death is the only way to achieve rights of Palestinian people, other people, Quebec uh, separatists, and jobs and peace. Obviously you cannot get a job if you spend all your time walking up and down streets with, with posters like that. You, you have to go to a place where the, where the jobs are. And of course, to find a job, the, the, the most unsuccessful way to find a job is to read papers like that. <laughs> and feel like working. This is something another. This is a Playboy magazine. Probably you heard the story about Larry Flynn, how, how successful is he to attract attention of media and, and public opinion by doing crazy things, getting involved in court case of, of the, um, the car manufacturer. Why he wants to do it, I don't know, but what he does attracts some strange mass attention. Playboy magazine makes jokes about Russian sex. That's the image they, they want to present to American people. But they don't explain to American people that the process of demoralization is not as is not the, a question of joke. This is Portugal after socialists came to power. On your left is a prostitute who was imported from East Germany to Lisbon, a communist prostitute in a country which 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 is just had its successful socialist revolution. Very interesting. What for? To make money? No, I'll tell you later. On the right, pornographic literature in a country with strong Catholic moral principles. Well, I don't know how many people of you like to drink alcohol. I did. But I noticed that some ads in, in magazines have some strange desire to joke about alcohol. And the jokes are closely related to justification of Soviet, Russian presence. A prominent Russian joined the secret service. Something to joke about while you drink vodka. I don't see any humor in that. Do you? Okay, this, this is a number of advertising of alcohol 
for which Canadians get into hot water. Comes the revolution, anyone can drink McGuinness vodka. Alberta vodka is superimposed on the picture of cruiser battleship Aurora. I don't know how many of you know that this is a historical relic in USSR. The revolution, communist Bolshevik revolution started with, with, the, with the cannon fired from that battleship. And uh, obviously Soviet embassy was insulted, so they sent a protest note to Pierre Trudeau. And the picture was removed from the magazine. When I was teaching at Carleton University in Ottawa, my superiors forced me to do an IQ test with two groups of my students. The idea was to answer about four, um, 100 questions to give answer, yes, no, or undecided. The more undecided or negative answers you give, the more, according to the compilers of this test, you are adaptable and useful to society. The more positive answers you give, the more questionable is your adaptability and, and uh, usefulness for, for your country. This is explanation how to score, how to count the scores. And now see the questions. Telling dirty joke is bad. A good soldier is a patriot. Yes, no, or undecided. Think about it. Every communist should be run out of the country. Yes, no, or undecided. The Bible is the greatest source of truth. Right? God is everywhere. A person who kills another person is a murderer. Yes, no, or undecided. <laughs> Okay, now, if you don't believe me, come, let's come back. See, I, I want to repeat you once again the conditions of the scoring. The more undecided and negative answers you give, the more you are adaptable and flexible and useful for the society. Do you understand what they are doing to kids? Okay, they are doing two things at a time. They teach them moral relativism. They teach them how to lie to get a greater score. Because obviously a child would say if a person killed another person, he is a murderer. But for the sake of getting a higher score, obviously a student would put no or undecided. So you teach your kid how to lie to be successful and to look adaptable and useful for society. Well, obviously I had to do that test, but I added one more question to that thing my own question. I said, what kind of society you are going to be useful to? <laughs> and most of my students give me an excellent answer. They say, a society where there is no moral principle, no respect to God, love, family and working ethics. Very simple. They are not that stupid. Here we are, Comrade Brezhnev. Now, this is the picture from a Soviet magazine. Obviously, uh, Soviet media tries to project their leaders in the most respectful way. Very impressive, very fatherly, very serious person. There is nothing surprising. What else is new? Of course. But this is Time magazine, an American magazine. The caption is not quite clear, but it says basically that Comrade Brezhnev doesn't give interview to Time magazine. The message is clear. He's a positive, caretaking person. He's too busy to take care of the world problems and, uh, and economical problems in, in Russia. It's a very humorous caption. But nevertheless, the impact, if you are not quite concerned about politics, what is your impression about this nice gentleman? Nice, smiling, tired, well... And this is how media presents your leaders. <laughs> I, I don't know whether, whether he deserves to be presented like that or not. This is a different question. <clears throat> this is... Prime Minister of Great Britain, about 10 years ago, together with Beatles. You may or may not like Beatles, me personally, I don't like them. But 
a prime minister of a country together with entertainers. The Queen, Her Majesty Queen, knighted Beatles, a highest honor which previously in all times was given only to the most deserving patriots of, of the uh, British Empire was given to a bunch of monkeys. <laughs> Valery Giscard d'Estaing is playing football. He is our guy. He plays piano. No, that, that, never mind what he does for politics or world uh, problems. He is nice, charming personality. Uh, Helmut Schmidt is taking part in the, in the circus performance. <laughs> nice, charismatic leader. Never mind what, what his policies are. He's, he's, he's popular. He's in the section of People of Time magazine. First Lady of the United States together with the pop singer, folk, folk song singer. Well, so what? You know, we had a saying in Russia that in old times, clowns were entertaining the royalty. Today, the mightiest of the world think it's a privilege to appear with entertainers. It's just the reverse of, of the old principle. You know? They are the entertainers of entertainers. Because they want it for their political career. Ed Kennedy dances in Moscow. Why? I mean, is, is that his business to, 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 to go to USSR? Why doesn't he occupy himself with something more relevant to the urging problems of the world? He thinks he is going to be popular. In America, maybe, but in Russia, they look at him as a schmuck. <laughs> Senator McGovern is talking to a gorilla somewhere in Africa. Not the gorilla man monkey, but a, a, a young member of National Patriotic Movement. The movement which is indoctrinated by the Soviets, armed and paid for. He thinks he's smart and, and he's something to, to uh, admire. I bet the, the guys who are standing behind don't think this way at all. Well, Kissinger just by mistake is here. Would you buy a second a second hand car from this? <laughs> Pierre Trudeau, Prime Minister of one of the most developed industrial nations, independent nation in the world, is befriended by Fidel Castro. If you remember, Canada never stopped trade relations with Cuba, despite the, ur despite the um, uh, urge from the United States government's administrations to not to sell Cuba strategic uh, technology and materials. No, he wouldn't listen to United States. He smiles at Fidel Castro. Meanwhile, his wife, estranged wife, Margaret Trudeau, is talking to rock star. I forget his name. Rollings. That's it. That's him, right? And he is posing for pictures like that. That's the prime minister's wife. That's her too, in French Riviera, with some Hollywood actor. Why? Fifty years ago, for a thing like that, a prime minister would have to resign. It's a shame for a nation. Not anymore. Okay, now detente. It's a, another debatable question. Why are we are so happy, Comrade Nixon? <laughs> What is so funny, I would like to ask you. Yeah? yeah, smile again. Why? He's standing next to a mass murderer and he's smiling. Why? Pierre Trudeau also attentively listens to Comrade Brezhnev's, well, I don't know what. Uh, West German counselor is helping Comrade Brezhnev to stand up because the senile leader of Russia is unable to stand up without Western aid.
<laughs> oh, you may, you may say, well, it's West Germans. They're too close to Russia. Probably they do it just in case. Okay, here's the same thing. Carter is helping the president of the mightiest empire, uh, mightiest power in the in the world, United States, is helping Comrade Brezhnev. You remember the incident when he, when Brezhnev almost stumbled down. Uh, down the staircase somewhere in Vienna, of course, and thanks to to Carter, he didn't fall. Uh, Andrew Young is talking to a dictator in in Africa. Again, uh, McGovern, I think, is talking to Augustino Neto, a Soviet puppet in Luanda. Why? Is it that necessary to be friendly, to smile to, at each other? Now we're coming to space, from Earth to space. Clouds over the space program. Why clouds? Mind you, this is after three or four successful landing on moon. Why clouds? Okay, here's two pictures. Left, Soviet cosmonaut walking into Kremlin Hall for, for ceremonious reception. On the right, two American cosmonauts casually walk, wa watching TV on the top, Soviet Politburo talking to the space pilots on orbit. On the lower picture, Lyndon Johnson with, um, I think that's Glenn, no? A, 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 an American spy pal, pilot. Now, it, it, even if you don't know anything about the theory of, of information, the comparison, mind you, this is a French magazine, it's not the Soviet propaganda. The comparison of the size of the pictures gives you the message already. What is more important? What is more impressive? Here, a picture from Soviet newspaper Pravda. A Soviet schoolboy compares two replicas of, I mean, replicas of Soviet uh, Soyuz spacecraft and American Apollo. Friendship in space, detente, right? Pay attention to the size of the spacecraft. They are almost identical, right? Now this is what the size, almost actual size is. The American spacecraft is on the left. It's almost twice as big as the Soviet one, right? Okay, this is a Soviet picture. This is an American picture with true sizes. Okay, you say, well, Soviet media, of course, tries to diminish the successes of the American space program. Now, this is an American media. On the left, a Soviet uh, moon walker or Soviet probe on moon. On the right side, an American space Volkswagen, as they say, it actually was used on the surface of moon. The sizes are almost identical, right? Wrong. The thing on the left is the size of a tea kettle. In other words, about 100 times smaller. But Time magazine does not explain it to the readers. An average person in the United States has an impression that the junk on the left is as important and as successful as the as the masterpiece of technology produced by American mind and uh, uh, ingenuity. Okay, you remember Skylab? There was a time when it just about to fall down on, on the United States or any other country. And the Pentagon was very worried. There were pictures, there were discussions on TV. Some strange characters even started joking about it. See the Skylab target. A lot of emotions expressed about the failure of United States Skylab. A lot of bitter opinions were expressed about the, about the unnecessary spending on, on space research. But when Soviet nuclear-powered satellite fall on the territory of Canada, there was no protest demonstrations, there was nothing like that. Nowhere in the world. Ask yourself why. According to some information, this was not a satellite at all. It was a flying atomic bomb.
Canadians spend something like 15 million dollars just to find the junk on their own territory. Thanks God it fell in inhabited areas of, of, of Canada, in Northwest Territories, where only penguins live. Or what if, if it fell on Toronto? A flying nuclear bomb? Oh boy. But no protests. Here, Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin happily looking at the uh, linking of American and Soviet spacecraft in where? In, in uh, American grounds control center. This is a picture from Time magazine. This is also a picture from Time magazine. Soviet citizens are watching the same moment linking of spacecraft. Think about it. Compare here, happiness. On the right, American representative of, of the NASA and the Brinian, very happy. That's how ordinary Soviet citizens think about the farce in space. They understand perfectly well that linking spacecraft in, in space is just a fake. It doesn't mean anything. Look at their faces. They are sad. A dream was realized. Was it worth the price? Pessimistic question, right? After all the successes of American space program, a media, the media tries to instill in your mind a doubt, pessimism. Why? Oh, this is a frog. <laughs> I don't know how much you know about frogs. I'll tell you that a frog can see a mosquito only if it moves across this, the area of its vision. If a mosquito quietly sits on a grass blade, the frog doesn't notice it. That's the attitude of American media. They do not notice problem unless it moves and moves close to Hilton where they station. <laughs> These are the people who may file a suit against me if, they, if I call them liars, but that's exactly what they are. They've been lying to you for years and years about the situation in Vietnam, in Russia, they were selling commercials, they were the risers and cars, and they sold you a rotten information, disinformation of what happens in the world. They have a vision of frog, but they look like semi-gods to you. And if I challenge their credibility, probably the people will call me a, a paranoid or a very nasty person. I may be a nasty person, but that's my opinion. I was a person who used to take these pe people for a ride when I was working for the Soviet side. Okay, if you don't believe me here, one of the most conservative, news conservative newspapers, uh, in this particular case it's Cana a Canadian newspaper, the Globe and Mail, editorial page. Nothing, nothing special, right? The malaise of liberal democracies. Uh, Saving Bhutto, former president of Pakistan, called Priority. And then there is another article on the, on the right here. U.S. out to dominate Pacific, Russians claim. Well, obviously somebody's opinion, right? Nothing unusual for an average reader. Russians claim that United States out to dominate Pacific. The idea is that well, the United States is obviously aggressive and they want to dominate something and Russians are unhappy about it. Somebody says. You read an article and uh, probably you may agree or disagree, but you have a feeling, the message of urgency. The, the nasty Americans again out to dominate Pacific. Now look who is the author. Alexandra Malishkin, Novosti Press Agency. Not a word. Who is Malishkin and what is Novosti Press Agency? An average reader will accept this article as a legitimate, overt expression of, of an ordinary journalist. It is not an opinion. It's a fabrication by an extension of KGB. 
Novosti Press Agency is the organization for which I worked for 12 years. This is highest example of dishonesty and disinformation. Just one line more would explain to, to an average reader what is that that he is reading. But alas, there is no explanation. Now this is the monument to Mother Russia in, in former Stalingrad. Now it is Volgograd. The, the statue is designed to, to instill feeling of patriotism and um, I don't know what else. Uh, pride maybe for, for the motherland. Uh, these are the pictures of construction, uh, high-rise high, high apartments in Moscow, glorious achievement of Soviet technology, caviar as an average staple food of Russians. <laughs> these are the, the, the minks and, and furs that Soviet citizens wear. You know, that's how they look when they relax. Fat, nice ladies, you know. You think it's Soviet propaganda? No, comrades. This is also some fashions, latest fashions from Russia. Right from Kremlin. For an average Soviet housewife. <laughs> well, obviously, it doesn't take much intelligence to understand that this is not quite true. And obviously, it has something to do with the Soviet propaganda. The myths and the realities of the KGB, you see, you don't see the heart. From Stalin to Kosygin, the myth and the realities by Avril Harriman, a former ambassador of the United States to USSR. Very complimenting article for the Soviet uh, system. And this is where it comes from. You thought it was from a Soviet magazine, right? No, it's from Look magazine. An American magazine which published that crap. If, if you don't believe me, I'll tell you that I was a person who accompanied a group of journalists from Look magazine when they came to Moscow on invitation from Novosti Press Agency. I made them to publish that thing for which I was awarded. I, I received the bonus, a free ticket to Italy for a week. <laughs> Now, this, this has looked like sheer high-class idiocy, but unfortunately, this is exactly what happened. It, it didn't took me much effort to convince the Americans to tell the American journalists from Look magazine to bring back this magazine to dedicate the whole issue to the glorious anniversary of Soviet revolution. This is what you were reading in your American magazine. This is how an average American perceived the Soviet way of life. A happy Soviet citizens. This is what an average girl in Russia wears. This is what they eat and drink. This is how they build their apartment houses. And this is how they're fiercely patriotic. Amazing. Anyway, so I will explain you how it all happens. The last two pictures I will not comment. I want you simply to look close into these eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the person who wants to liberate you, wanted at least, not anymore, he is dead. But there are many other people with the same type of eyes. If I were a deeply religious person, my answer to that picture would be, these are the eyes of a Satan. He is. Nice fellow, right? <laughs> United Nations celebrated back in 1969, I think, the 100th anniversary of his birthday. The greatest leader of mankind. God forbid us to have leaders like that. Well, that's all. So that Subversion is the term, if, if you look in a, in a dictionary or criminal code to that matter, 
usually is, ex is explained as a part of activity to destroy things like uh, religion, government system, political, eco economical system of a country. And usually it's linked to espionage and such romantic things as blowing up bridges, sidetracking trains, um, clock and dagger activity in Hollywood style. Uh, when what I'm going to talk about now has absolutely nothing to do with the cliché of espionage or KGB activity of collecting information. So the greatest mistake or mis mis misconception, I think, is that uh, whenever we are talking about KGB for some strange reason, uh, starting from Hollywood movie makers to professors of political science and quote-unquote experts on, on Soviet affairs or Kremlinologists as they call themselves, they think that the most desirable thing for Andropov and the whole KGB is to steal blueprints of some supersonic jet, bring it back to Soviet Union and sell it to the Soviet military industrial complex. It's only partly true. If, if, if we take <clears throat> the whole time, money, and manpower that the Soviet Union and KGB in particular spends outside of USSR border, we will discover, of course there are no official statistics unlike with CIA or FBI, that the espionage as such occupies only 10 to 15 percent of money, time, and manpower. 15 percent of the activity of KGB. The rest 85 percent is always subversion. And unlike a dictionary of English, Oxford Dictionary, subversion in Soviet terminology means always a destructive, aggressive activity aimed to destroy the country, nation, or geographical area of your enemy. So there's no romantics in there, absolutely. No blowing up bridges, no microfilms in Coca-Cola cans, nothing of that sort. <laughs> no James Bond nonsense. It's most of the, this activity is overt, legitimate, and easily observable if you give yourself time and trouble to observe it. But according to the law and, and law enforcement systems of the Western civilization, it's not a crime. Exactly because of misconception, manipulation of terms. We think that subverter is a person who is going to blow up our beautiful bridges. No. Subverter is a student who comes for exchange, a diplomat, an actor, an artist, a journalist like myself was 10 years ago. Now, subversion <clears throat> is an activity which is a two-way traffic. You cannot subvert an enemy which doesn't want to be subverted. If you know history of Japan, for example, before uh, 20th century, Japan was a closed society. The moment a foreign boat comes to the shores of Japan, the Imperial Japanese Army politely tell them to get lost. <laughs> and if American salesman comes to the shore of Japan, let's say 60 or 70 years from now back, and says, oh, I have a very beautiful vacuum cleaner for you, you know, with the good financing, he says, please leave us, we don't need your vacuum cleaner. If they don't leave, they shoot them to preserve their culture, ideology, traditions, Values intact. You were not able to subvert Japan. You cannot subvert Soviet Union because the borders are closed. The media is censored by the government. The population is controlled by the KGB and internal police. With all the beautiful glossy pictures of Time magazine and Magazine America, which is published by by the uh, American Embassy in Moscow. You cannot subvert Soviet citizens because the magazine never reaches Soviet citizens. It's collected from the newsstands and thrown to garbage can. Subversion 
can be only successful when the initiator, the actor, the, act, the agent of subversion has a responsive target. It's a two-way traffic. United States is a receptive target of subversion. There is no response similar to that one from United States to the Soviet Union. It stops halfway somewhere. It never reaches here. The theory of subversion goes all the way back 2,500 years ago. The first human being who formulated the tactics of subversion was a Chinese philosopher by the name of Sun Tzu. to 2,500 years B.C. He was an advisor for several imperial courts in, in ancient China. And he said, after long meditation, that to implement, foreign, uh, to implement state policy in a warlike manner, it's the most Counterproductive, barbaric, and inefficient to fight on a battlefield. You know that war is continuation of state policy, right? So if you want successfully to implement your state policy and you start fighting, this is the most idiotic way to do it. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all, but to subvert anything of value in the country of your enemy until such time that the perception of reality of your enemy is screwed up to such an extent that he does not perceive you as an enemy and that your system, your civilization and your ambitions look to your enemy as an alternative, if not desirable, then at least feasible, better red than dead. That's the ultimate purpose the final stage of subversion, after which you can simply take your enemy without a single shot being fired if the subversion is successful. This is basically what subversion is. As you see, not a single mentioning of blowing up bridges. Of course, Sun Tzu didn't know about blowing up bridges. Maybe there were not that many bridges at that time. <laughs> but the basics of subversion is being taught to every student of KGB school in USSR and to officers of, of military academies. I'm not sure if the same author is included in the list of reading for American officers to say nothing about ordinary students of political science. I had difficulty to find the translation of Sun Tzu in, in the library of of a university in Toronto and later on here in, in Los Angeles. But it's a, it's a book which is not available. It is forced to every student in USSR. Every student who is, who is taught to be dealing further in, in, in his future career with foreigners. What subversion is? Basically, it consists of four periods, time-wise. If we start from here, and go this way, time, right? This is the beginning point. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called, basically, demoralization. It says for itself what it is. It takes from, um, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. Why? by 15 or 20 years. This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation, one lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. No more, no less. Usually, it takes from 15 to 20 years. What it includes? It includes influencing or by various methods, infiltration, uh, propaganda methods, direct contacts, doesn't really matter. I will describe them later. 
of various areas where public opinion is formulated or shaped. Religion, educational system, social life, administration, law enforcement system, military, of course, and labor and employer relations, economy, okay? Five areas. Uh, I will not write them down because we'll not have enough space. Some, sometimes when I describe all the methods, uh, students ask me question, are you sure this is the result of the Soviet influence? Not necessarily. You see, the tactic of subversion about which I'm talking is similar to the martial art, the Japanese martial art. If, you're, if some of you are familiar with that tactic, probably you will remember that if an enemy is bigger and heavier than yourself, it would be very painful to resist his direct strike. If a heavier person wants to strike me in the face, it would be very naive and counterproductive to stop his blow. The Chinese and Japanese judo art tells us what to do. First to avoid the strike, then to grab the fist and continue his movement in the direction where it was before, right? Until the enemy crashes in the wall. You see? So, what happens here? The target country obviously does something wrong. If it's a free democratic society, there are many different movements within the society. There are obviously, in every society, there are people who are against this society. They may be simple criminals, ideologically in disagreement with the, with the state policy conscientious enemies, simply psychotic personalities who are against anything, right? And finally, there are a small group of agents of a foreign nation, bought, subverted, recruited, right? The moment all these movements will be directed in one direction, right? This is the time to catch that movement and to continue it until the movement forces the whole society into collapse, into crisis, right? So that's exactly the martial art tactic. We don't stop an enemy. We let him go. We help him to go in the direction we want them to go. Okay? So, on the stage of demoralization, obviously there are tendencies in each society, in each country, which are going to opposite direction from the basic moral values and principles. To take advantage of these movements, to capitalize on them, is the main purpose of the originator of subversion. So we have religion, we have education, we have uh, social life, we have power structure, we have labor relations, uh, unions, and finally we have law and order. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? These are the areas of application of subversion. What it means exactly, <clears throat> in case of religion, destroy it, ridicule it, replace it with various sects, cults, which bring people's attention, faith, whether it is naive, primitive, doesn't really matter. As long as the basically accepted religious dogma is being slowly eroded, and taken away from the supreme purpose of religion, to keep people in touch with, with the supreme being. That serves the purpose. Therefore, replace it, accepted, respected religious organizations with fake organizations. Distract people's attention from the real faith and attract them to various different faiths. Education. Distract them from learning something which is constructive, pragmatic, efficient. Instead of mathematics, physics, foreign languages, chemistry, teach them history of urban warfare, natural food, uh, <laughs> home economy, your sexuality, anything. As long as it takes you away. Okay? Uh, social life. Replace traditionally established 
institutions and organizations, with fake organizations. Take away the initiative from people. Take away the responsibility from naturally established links between individuals, group of individuals, and society at large, and replace them with artificially, bureaucratically controlled bodies. Instead of social life and friendship between neighbors, establish social workers' institutions. The people who are on payroll of whom? Society? No. Bureaucracy. The main concern of social workers is not your family, not you, not social relations between groups of people. The main concern is to get the paycheck from the government. What will be the result of their social work doesn't really matter. They can develop all kinds of concepts to show them, to show to the government and to the people that they're useful. Okay. Away from the natural links. Power structure. Okay. The natural bodies of administration, which are traditionally either elected by, by people at large or appointed by elected leaders of society, are being actively substituted by artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected, never, as a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. One of such group is media. Who elected them? <laughs> how come, how come they, they, pay, they, they, they have so much power? Almost monopolistic power on your mind. They can rape your mind. But who elected them? How come they are, they have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for, for the elected by you, president and, and his administration? Who the hell are they? Uh, Spiro Agnew who was hated by the liberal left, called them a bunch of enfeebled snobs. And that's exactly what they are. They think they know. They don't. The, the level of mediocrity in a big establishment like New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major television network, you don't have to be excellent journalist. You have to be exactly a mediocre journalist. That's easier to survive. There's no competition anymore. You have your good, nice income, $100,000 a year. That's it. Whether you are better or worse doesn't really matter anymore. As soon as you are smiling to the camera and do your job. That's it. No more, no more competition. Power structure slowly is eroded by the bodies and groups of people who do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power, and yet they do have power. Okay. Together with that, there is another process. Law enforcement, law and order uh, organization and structure is being eroded. For the last 20, 25 years, you, you, if, if you see old movies and new movies, you can see that in new movies, a policeman, an officer of the United States Army, looks dumb, angry, psychotic, paranoid. A criminal looks nice, kind of, well, he smokes hash and, and shoots the, uh, whatever, drug. But basically, he's a nice human being. He's creative. And he's unproductive only because society oppresses him. Whereby a general of Pentagon is always, by definition, a dumb, a war maniac. <laughs> a policeman is a pig, rude policeman. He abuses his power. No? A generality, generalization like that. The hatred, the mistrust to the people who are supposed to protect you and enforce law and order. Moral relativity. The Angela Buona process lasted two years in Los Angeles. And yet there are still some lawyers who say, look, he's a nice character, as a matter of fact. There was some witness who said, also a criminal, who said, well, he's a nice guy. I asked him one day to burn a house of my enemy, and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> he's a nice fellow. <laughs> Erosion. <laughs> a slow substitution of basic moral principles, whereby a criminal is not a criminal, actually. He's a defendant, even if his guilt is proven. There is still a doubt. To kill or not to kill, to be or not to be, thy shall not kill, yes, but 
this uh, line may not necessarily be applicable to a murderer. Thy shall not murder. That should be the, the, the presumption, not, not that thy shall not kill. Okay, labor relations. At this stage, within 15 to 20 years, we destroy the traditionally established links of bargaining between employer and employee. The classical Marxist-Leninist uh, theory of natural exchange of goods. Uh, a person A has five sacks of grain and person B has five pairs of shoes. And the natural exchange without money is when they bargain between each other. And only with the introduction of the third force C, uh, an entirely third foreign stranger who says, no, don't give him five sacks of grain, give it to me. And you give me your five pairs of shoes and I will distribute it accordingly. So that the economy will go. This is the death of natural exchange, the death of natural bargaining. Well, trade unions were established 100 years ago. The objective was to improve working conditions and to protect the rights of workers from those employers who were abusing their, their right because they had more money. Objectively, at that time, initially, the trade union movement did work. What we see now is that the bargaining pro process is no longer resulting into, in the compromise, which is leading objectively to betterment of working conditions and increase of salary. What we see is that after each prolonged strike, the workers lose. Even if they have 10% increase of their salaries, they cannot catch up due to inflation and due to missed time. More than that, Millions of people suffer from that strike because economy now is interdependent. It's intertwined like one body. If previously uh, steel workers, say 100 years ago, could strike and nobody would suffer, now it's impossible anymore. If a garbage collector strikes today, the rest of the multi-million city is stinking. I mean, the, the, there's no more service. Uh, in Quebec, for example, we had the electricians who were on strike in the middle of winter. You can freeze your bottom, and they still were on strike. Did they catch up with the salary? No, they lost. Who benefited? The leaders of trade union. What is the motivation for strike? Improving, improving a, wor a, a worker's condition? No, obviously it's not. Then what is it? Ideology. To prove to these capitalists and the obedient horde of workers like sheep follow these people and they cannot disobey. Why? Because if they do, you know what happens to them. Pickets, murders, shooting truck drivers by picketers. In Montreal, for example, I saw with my own eyes when I was correspondent of CBC International, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, when the workers of aircraft factory destroyed computers and, and, and the equipment in the factory. And they, the, the administration employed strike breakers. Their cars were turned upside down and burned. Their houses were burned. Their kids were intimidated. And some victims were there. Of that we can be sure. Why? To improve conditions of worker? No. Ideology. Okay, so this is what happens, basically. It may or may not happen without the help of the Soviet Union. But the natural tendencies are being greatly taken advantage of and capitalized by the Soviet propaganda systems. How? Whenever trade union strikes, we have influx of propaganda, mass media, ideological dissemination. The workers right, and we repeat it like parrots. Yes, workers right. Who's right? Workers? No. The, the only freedom of worker to sell his labor according to his own desire and will is taken away from him. By whom? By trade union boss. Unlimited power is given. Responsibility. I want to sell my labor not for two fifty an hour, but for two dollars. I don't have right. My freedom is denied to me. I know that if I sell my work for two, for two dollars an hour, not for three dollars an hour, I will compete better with the, with the other guy who is lazy and more greedy. 
I don't need two, three dollars. I need only two dollars. No, I was made to believe by media, by business, by advertising agencies that I need more and more and more. Have you ever heard any advertising on TV to consume less? No. No way. Whether you need a, a, a six-cylinder car or not, you have to buy it and hurry up. <laughs> when I was driving here on the local radio station, an excited announcer said, you hurry up, rush and save, save, save. There is a pantyhose sale. <laughs> save by buying more. <laughs> of course, of course. It, it would be too naive to expect that KGB makes that advertising agency to, to do such a crazy commercial. No, of course not. But what we did when I was working for Novosti Press, we would snow plow editorial offices, student organizations, religious groups with literature of class struggle, May, if, if not directly Marxism, Leninist propaganda, then a propaganda of of the legitimate aspirations of working class, betterment of life, equality, equality, mind you. President Kennedy once said, people, we will make America to believe that people are born equal. Are people born equal? Is there any mentioning in the Bible or any other holy scripture in any religion, any religion, if you don't believe me, go to the library and check it. There is not a single word about equality. Just the opposite. By your deeds, God will judge you. What you do is important. The merit of your personality. You cannot legislate equality if you want to be equal. You have to be equal. You have to deserve it. And yet we build our society on the principle of equality. We say people are equal. We know it is false. It's a lie. Some people are tall and stupid. Others are short, bold, and clever. <laughs> if we make them... If we make them equal by force, <laughs> if we put the principle of equality in the basis of our social political structure, it's the same thing as building a house on sand. Sooner or later it will collapse, and that's exactly what happens. And we, as Soviet propaganda makers, are trying to push you in the direction which you go yourself. Equality, yes, equality, people are equal. Land of equal opportunities. Is it true or not? Think about it. Equal opportunities, should there be equal opportunities? For me, and for a lazy bastard who come here from some other country and immediately registers as, as a welfare <laughs> uh, recipient benefits. I never received a single dot. No, sorry, I did receive once. But I never applied for welfare. For the 13 years, I took any job. Security guard, journalist, taxi driver, anything. Well, I was restless, but some people don't like it. They immediately... So why should we be... E why should we have equal opportunities? Why? The equal opportunity to excel. Equal opportunity in equal circumstances, yes, but we know people are different. To excel, yes, provided we reach the same level of excellency, perfection, which is hypothetical distant future. Yes, maybe, but we know perfectly well that even with the best intentions, people could not be equal. Why should we have equality in, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, say, legal system? Myself, I'm, I'm considering myself a law-abiding citizen, and a person who comes here to rob and shoot, say, the, the, the United States administration under Carter imported thousands of Cuban criminals. They were non-criminals, yet they were accepted. Do you think it's fair if myself and my wife from Philippines who work like a, excuse me, horse, uh, as a lab technician in, in the hospital, 
should have the same rights as a criminal from, from Cuba? Why? And yet we repeat as parents, equality, equality, equality. And the Soviet propaganda system helps us to believe that equality is something which is desirable. Democracy, as it was established by fathers of this country, of, of this system, in the last century, is, is not equality. It's the system where different people, unequal people, have a chance to survive and help each other in constant competition, in constant perfection. Not in equality, which is superimposed from, from a, a, a godfather or a nice person in Washington, D.C. And the absolute equality exists in Soviet Union, quote-unquote equality. Everybody is equal in, in dirt, except some people are more equal than the others in Politburo. <laughs> <laughs> so, the moment you, you bring a country to the point of almost total demoralization, when nothing works anymore, when you are not sure whether it is right or, or wrong, good and bad, where there's no division between evil and good, when even the leaders of church sometimes say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice, is justified in a country like Nicaragua, El Salvador, well, maybe Rhodesia, and we listen to them and say, yeah, probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist-Leninism. That is my former colleague from Novosti Press Agency. Okay, so we reach that point. The next step is destabilization. Again, this word says for itself what it is. To destabilize all the relations, all the accepted institutions and organizations in a country of your enemy. How you do it? You don't have to send up a battalion of KGB agents to blow up bridges. No. You let them do it themselves. The area of application is, again, it's, it's, it's narrower now. Not like the, the previous case. The overt legitimate actions... Of the, of the KGB in this case would be ha hardly noticeable. There is no crime if a professor who recently went to USSR introduces a course of Marxism-Leninism in, in a, a, a Californian college, for example. Nobody is going to, to come to his doorstep and say, okay, mister, come, you are under arrest. No, it's not a crime. It's not even considered a moral crime against your country. So the area of application here is narrowing down to ec economy, again, labor relations, right? To law and order, plus military. And uh, economy, law and order, yes, and again, the uh, media, but uh, wider scope, a little bit different, I'll explain it later. Okay, basically, three areas. Economy. The radicalization of bargaining process. If on that stage we still could achieve, theoretically, some positive compromise between the negotiating sides with, with uh, say, uh, ar ar arbitrary, in introduction of arbitrary judges, uh, third side, uh, objectively judging the, the demands of both sides. Here it's radicalization. On, this, on the stage of destabilization, we cannot come to compromise even within a family. The husband and wife couldn't figure out which is better. Husband wants his kids to eat at the table, and wife wants him, a child, to roam around the room and, and drop food all over the floor. They cannot <laughs> come to compromise unless they start a fight. It's impossible to reach a compromise, constructive compromise, between neighbors. Some people say, I don't like you to watering your lawn at that time because exactly at that time I'm walking my dog and he's getting nervous. That he cannot uh, pass his bowels, you know. So they cannot compromise. They go to a, a, a civil court or something like that. Radicalization of human relations. No more compromise. Fight, fight, fight. 
the normal, traditionally accepted relations are destabilized. The relations between teachers and students in schools and colleges fight. The, the relations between, in economical sphere, between laborers and, and employers are further uh, radicalized. No more acceptance of the legitimacy of demands of workers. Unlike Japanese, with the theory Z, if you, if you ever heard about it, where the workers are involved in the decision-making process, therefore they don't have uh, moral incentive to, to fight their, uh, their bosses. In the United States, it's just the opposite. The harder is the, the fight, the better. The more heroic they look. When the Greyhound uh, network was on strike recently, the correspondents of local TV networks uh, all over the United States were approaching these strikers and they said, oh yes, we are doing something nice. They look like heroes and they were proud. There was some family, uh, the husband was a uh, bus driver. Now they decided in, 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 in the protest against the uh, uh, bosses to camp somewhere in the forest. And they were presented to the, to the audience as, as a heroic, nice people. You see? The violent clashes between passengers, picketers, and, and the strikers are presented as something normal. 10, 15, 20 years ago, we would, we would, be, uh, we would be angry, say, why, why, why so much hatred? Today we are not. We say, well, it's commonplace. Radicalization, militarization sometimes. As I explained uh, uh, on that stage, I, I took a step a little bit further. Shooting people. Okay. Law and order now also is uh, pushed into the area where previously people settled their differences uh, peacefully and legitimately. Now we are getting with this uh, uh, court cases in the, in the smallest irrelevant cases. We cannot solve our problems anymore. The society at large becomes more and more antagonistic between individuals, between groups of individuals, and the society at large. The media puts himself in the opposition to the society in general, at large. Separate, alienated. Okay? On that stage, you remember I was talking uh, a, a couple of hours ago about the sleepers. That's when the students from, say, United States, if they are trained in, in Lumumba University, or developing nations, that's the students I was dealing with, are being sent back from the Soviet Union here. Or if they were already in the United States, in the country, which is the object of, of subversion, they spring to action. The sleepers go up. They slept for 15 to 20 years. Now they become leaders of groups, preachers, uh, I don't know, public, public figures. Prominently they act, in, they actively include themselves in a political process. All of a sudden we see a homosexual. Fifteen years ago he did his dirty job and nobody cared. Now he makes it a political issue. He demands recognition, respect, human rights. And Hiral is a ra large group of people. And there are violent clashes between him and police, his group and, and ordinary people. No matter what. It's black against white, yellows against green, doesn't matter where the division line goes. As long as this group come into antagonistic clash, sometimes militantly, sometimes with firearms. That is destabilization process. The sleepers many of whom are simply KGB agents, become leaders of the process of destabilization. Doesn't mean that Comrade Andropov sends Comrade Ivanov to the United States. The person who takes care is already here. He is a respected citizen of the United States. Sometimes he, he gets money from various foundations for, for his legitimate uh, struggle for I don't know, human rights, women rights, kid lib, prison lib, whatever. There are sympathetic Americans who donate their money to him. This stabilization process usually leads directly 
to the process of crisis. In case of developing nations, that's the area where I, I was active. The process starts when, when the legitimate bodies of power, the social structure collapse. It's, it cannot function anymore. So instead, we have artificial body injected into society, such as non-elected committees. You remember I was talking about them here. Social workers who are not elected by people, media who, self, who are self-appointed rulers of your opinion, uh, some strange groups uh, which claim that they know how to lead society forward. They don't usually. All they care is how to collect donations and, and, prom and sell their own concocted ideology, mixture of religion and ideology. Here, we have all this artificial body claiming power. If the power is denied to them, they take it by force. In case of Iran, for example, all of a sudden we have revolutionary committees. Who? What, what kind of revolution? There was no revolution yet, and yet they had the committees. They were taking power of, of judgment. They had, they had the power of execution, they had the power of, of uh, le legislation, and that they had the power of, of uh, judicial. Uh, all of them combined in one person, who is half-baked intellectual, sometimes graduated from Harvard University or, or Berkeley. He comes back to his country and, and he, he thinks that he, he knows the answer to all the social economical problems. Okay? Crisis is when society cannot function any more productively. It collapses, obviously. That's the, the word for crisis. So therefore, the population at large is looking for a savior. The religious groups are expecting a messiah to come. The workers say, we have family to feed. Let's have a strong government, maybe socialist government, centralized. When, when somebody put, put the employers on their place and, and let us work, we are sick and tired of going to strike and, and missing overtime and all that stuff. We need some strong man, strong government, a leader, a savior is needed. Population is sick and tired already. And here we are, we have a savior. Either a foreign nation comes in, or the local group of, of leftists, Marxists, no matter what they call themselves, Sandinista, a reverend or some sort, Bishop Muzureva, like in, in Zimbabwe, doesn't matter. A savior comes and says, I will lead you. So we have two alternatives here. Civil war. An invasion. Okay? See how it goes? Civil war, we know what it is. Lebanon is, is the best example. The civil war, which was artificially implanted in Lebanon by injection of force of PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. Invasion, we have in many other countries like Afghanistan, uh, and name any East European country, it, it was invaded by the Soviet army. But the result is the same. The next stage is normalization. Normalization is a very ironic word, of course. It is borrowed from 1968 situation in Czechoslovakia, when the Soviet propaganda and after them, New York Times declared the country is normalized. The tanks moved into Prague, so there is no more Prague Spring, there is no more violence. Normal. Normalization. At that stage, the self-appointed rulers of the society don't need any revolution anymore. They don't need any radicalism anymore. So, this is the reverse from destabilization. Basically, it is stabilizing the country by force. So all the sleepers and activists and social workers and liberals and homosexuals and professors and Marxists and Leninists are being eliminated physically sometimes. They've done their job already. Okay? They are not needed anymore. 
The new rulers need stability to exploit the nation, to exploit the country, to take advantages of the victory. Okay? So no more revolutionaries, please. And that's exactly what happens in a number of countries. You remember Bangladesh? This is the crisis in which I was instrumental. First they had Mujibur Rahman. In 1971 he was the leader of, of People's Party, Avami League, with moustache like Stalin. He was in, in, in Russia many times. In five years he was shot by his former colleagues, Marxists. He fulfilled his function. In Afghanistan it happened three times. First there was Taraki, then there was Amin, now there's Babra Karmal. They killed each other successively, one after another. The moment he fulfills his duty, the first one demoralized country, the second destabilized, the third one brought it to crisis. Goodbye, comrades. <laughs> Babra Karmal comes from Moscow and put him in, in, into the seat of power. Same thing happened in Grenada recently. Maurice Bishop, Marxist, was killed by Austin, what's his name, General something was also a Marxist, right? So no more revolutions, please. Normalization now. From now on, no more strikes, no more homosexuals, no more women lib, no more kid lib, no more lib, period. <laughs> a good, solid, democratic, proletarian freedom. <laughs> That's it. Now, to reverse this process takes enormous effort. When today, United States had to invade Grenada to reverse the process of subversion. Some people say, boy, this is not good, it's not kosher to invade the beautiful country, island of Grenada. <laughs> well, why didn't you stop the process here, when Grenada was just approached by leftists? Why not to prevent Maurice Bishop to come in power in the first place? Did Grenadians want him? Very questionable. They didn't know who was Maurice Bishop in the first place. He came to power by coup d'etat himself. Okay? No, we let the situation develop further and further and further until the crisis and normalization very soon. And then the United States decided to invade country, discovering that the, the country was absolutely a military base for the Soviet Union. Of course it's a drastic measure. Of course it's, it's a pity that uh, Marine Corps had to, to lose, what, 17 lives. Very bad. Why not to stop the process before it comes to crisis? Oh no, intellectuals will not let you. It's interference in the, into domestic affairs. They are very careful not to, not, not to let American administration to interfere in domestic affairs of Latin American countries. They don't mind Soviet Union interfering in these affairs. <laughs> Okay. So to reverse this process from here, it takes only and always military force. No other force on earth can reverse this process at this point. At this point, it does not take military invasion of the United States Army. It takes strong action, like in Chile, a CIA covert involvement to prevent the savior from outside to come into power and to stabilize country before it erupts into civil war. Okay? Support the right-wing conservative forces. Buy money, buy crooks or love, doesn't matter. Stabilize the country. Don't let the crisis develop into, into civil war or invasion. Oh no, your liberals will say it's, it's against the law. <laughs> the Congress will not appropriate money for covert actions of CIA. Why not? Should we wait till the normalization come and Soviet tanks land in, in, in Los Angeles airport? Now, at that point, at the point of destabilization, also the process could be reversed. Again, easily than this. No CIA involvement at this point. You know what it takes here? Restriction of some liberties for small groups which are self-declared enemies of the society. As simple as that. Oh no, the media and liberals will tell you this is against the American Constitution. How can we, uh, by force, deny the civil rights to criminals, for example? It's, it's not good. Okay? So we allow them to... Okay, if you allow the criminals to have civil rights, go on and bring the country to the crisis. This is a bloodless way to do. 
curb the rights. I mean, not to put them in prison. No, no, I'm not talking about putting all the gays from San Francisco in the concentration camp. Do not allow them to take political force. Do not elect them to the seats of power, whether it is municipality level, state level, or federal level. It has to be bitten in the heads of American voters that a person like that in the seats of power is an enemy. Do not be afraid of this word. It is an enemy. If he is not an enemy here, he will be here. Later on, he will be shot, of course. <laughs> but at this point, he is an enemy. Okay? You are doing great service by denying him a right to capitalize on his own crazy ideas and become a powerful man, a, a man who uses the seat of power. Restriction of certain freedoms and permissiveness at that point would prevent sliding into crisis and probably will return the process of destabilization. To curb unlimited power, monopolistic power of trade unions here at that point would save economy from collapsing. To introduce a law to stop private companies of raping public opinion's mind in, con in, the, in the direction of consumerism. No company must have a right to force you into buying more unless you want it. There must be a law. You want to advertise your, your car? Okay. But not a single mentioning of buying it now and saving money. <laughs> it must be against the law to force people to consume more. Self-restraint. Previously, before this process started, the self-restraint was a business of church, religion. Because our preachers, the fathers of church, would tell us, material values are good, but it's not the prime function of human being. Because you have to live with something. Obviously, the design for our life is not to consume more deodorants. <laughs> there must be something greater. If such a complicated instrument as human body was created, obviously there must be some higher purpose for that. And it's very easy to avoid destabilization by denying the greedy companies one little freedom, one little liberty, forcing you into turning yourself into processors of unwanted pr products and goods. They turn you into machines, like a, 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 the worm who there's inlet and outlet. So, and how long a, a, an average appliance lasts these days? Less than a year. Why? Where's workmanship? Oh, we want you to buy more. Okay. This stabilization process could be easily overcome if, as I say, the society by its own will or after persuasion by the leaders will come to the idea of self-restraint. It's so hard we want to consume more, but you have to. Unless you will come to this stage, when as we say in Russia, if Sahara Desert ever becomes a communist state, there will be shortage of sand. <laughs> so you have to curb your... <laughs> You have, to, you have to curb your expectations at this point before it's too late. But no, we don't want to do it. Demoralization process. Again, it's the easiest thing to reverse. First of all, by restricting import of propaganda. The easiest thing to do. Unlimited, unrestrained import of Soviet literature, Soviet journalists. Uh, giving Soviet propaganda and ideological agitators equal time on American TV network. It has to be stopped. And it's easy. They won't, they won't be offended, mind you. As a matter of fact, they will respect America more. But when my former colleague Vladimir Posner appears on Nightline and Ted Koppel asks him, Well, Vladimir, what do you think about this? And What can he think? 
He is an instrument of propaganda. He thinks what, what, what Comrade Andropov tells him to think. <laughs> he is just a nice, articulate mouthpiece of the Soviet uh, uh, subversion system. And Ted Koppel makes you believe that my friend Vladimir Posner thinks... <laughs> <laughs> the process of demoralization may not have started at all if at that point the country, which is a recipient of subversion, actively, not violently, but actively, prevents importation of foreign ideology. I don't want America to follow the pattern of ancient Japan. You don't have to shoot every foreigner when it approaches the sacred borders of the United States. But when he offers you a junk in the disguise of very shiny something, you have to tell him, no, we have our own junk. <laughs> <laughs> if at that point the society is strong, brave, and conscientious enough to stop importation of ideas which are foreign, then the whole chain of events could be prevented. Recently I've been to the Philippines and I was shocked how in big cities like Manila, children listen to deafening music. A melodious nation with long traditions of, of good, nice ethnic music introduced by Spanish long time ago, maybe two centuries, three centuries ago, I don't remember how long. All of a sudden, listen to musical garbage, blasting their radios at, at full blast, at the full volume. Why? In India, I spent many years watching the reactions of Indians walking out of movie theaters after seeing Hollywood production. They they couldn't figure out why Americans are so wasteful. They smash their cars, their shiny cars, every five minutes. How come they shoot each other for half a million dollars? Is it true that they are so sex, sex uh, uh, I mean, obsessed with sex? Can you imagine showing a movie where each five minutes there is a copulation on the screen to a country like India with long traditions, tradition of of uh, respect to, to these private matters, or to Pakistan. And United States expect these people to respect you? No way. Oh yes, they will see the movie, they'll pay five rupees to see that garbage. But they walk out and will tell their kids, don't respect Americans, don't be like Americans. See? So, the process of demoralization could be stopped right here, both as an expert and as an import. And that takes one step, one very important thing to do. You don't have to expel all the KGB agents from Washington, D.C. The most difficult and at the same time the simplest answer to the subversion is to start it here and even before. By Bringing back the society to religion, something that you cannot touch and eat and put on yourself, but something that rules society and makes it move and preserve it. A Soviet scientist, Shafarevich, who has nothing to do with religion, he is a computer scientist, did a very intensive research <clears throat> on the history of socialist countries. He calls socialist or communist <clears throat> any country with a centralized economy and a pyramidal style of power structure. And he discovered, actually he didn't discover it, he just brought to attention of, of his readers, that civilizations like Mohenjo-Daro in the river Hindus area, like Egypt, like Maya, Incas, like Babylonian culture, collapsed and disappeared from the surface of earth. The moment they lost religion, as simple as that, they disintegrated. Nobody remembers about them anymore. Well, distantly. <clears throat> so, 
the ideas are moving society and keeping mankind as 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 society of human beings, intelligent, moral agents of God. The facts, the truth, the exact knowledge may not. All the sophisticated technology and computers will not prevent society from disintegrating and eventually dying out. Have you ever met a person who would sacrifice his life, freedom, for the truth like that? This is truth. I never met the person who said, this is truth and I'm ready to shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> to defend the truth. Right? But millions sacrifice their life, freedom, comfort, everything for things like God. Like Jesus Christ. It's an honor. Some martyrs in, in the Soviet concentration camp died. And they died in peace. Unlike those who shouted, long live Stalin, knowing perfectly well that he may not live long. <laughs> something which is... Something which is not material moves society and helps it to survive. And the other way around. The moment we turn into two by two is four and make it a guiding principle of our life, our existence, we die. Even though this is true and this we cannot prove. We only can feel and have faith in it. So the answer to ideological subversion, strangely enough, is very simple. You don't have to shoot people, you don't have to aim mi missiles and Pershings and cruise missiles at Andropov's headquarters. You simply have to have faith and prevent subversion. In other words, not to be a victim of subversion. Don't try to be a person who in Zudo is trying to smash your enemy and being caught by your hand. Don't strike like that. Strike with the power of your spirit and moral superiority. If you don't have that power, it's high time to develop it. And that's the only answer. That's it. Thank you. Can you describe how a concept is formulated, turned into propaganda, and then ends up on someone's bumper sticker or in a newspaper? What's the step-by-step -step process? The other thing is, how close is the Politburo to the actual propaganda creating process? Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, the 007 incident was uh, notable in the fact that it took a long time before the Soviets responded to it, and then the military took the lead in terms of explaining what had happened rather than the uh, political organs. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know why that actually happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the propaganda concepts are not being developed. They, they had been developed long time ago. There's nothing basically new in the concept of, of overall propaganda uh, methods and goals. The ultimate goal, however ridiculous it may sound, or primitive or simplistic, is the world domination. Many, uh, many experts in foreign policy would ridicule my opinion, but this is what it is. I saw it with my own eyes. I was a part of that. So, and my father was, I think I mentioned that before, he was an inspector of land forces. He traveled all over the world where the Soviet troops were stationed. So he knows perfectly well that the troops are not stationed there to collect harvest for Cubans or, or to help Afghanis to to uh, develop the, uh, for the hordes of cattle or goats. They are there for one purpose, world domination. The concepts, the immediate issues or problems are created, of course, for propaganda purposes, and they end up uh, as a bumper stickers, 
probably not uh, long. Uh, it takes really short period of time. Unlike some other things in, in the Soviet system, uh, propaganda takes propaganda is one of the things that they don't save money on. And um, there is a, a huge apparatus of propaganda experts in USSR. Novosti Press Agency is just one of them, one of the organizations. But apart from them, that there is a Department of Agitation and Propaganda with this, within the Central Committee. There are faceless people, names of whom you will never learn. Uh, they are kind of classified. Uh, I didn't explain you the methods today because it will take us another day. The methods include such things as semantic manipulation. The words and expressions are being coined at the rate of five expressions a minute by extremely clever, educated experts. And the media outside of USSR obediently repeats this cliché. I give you just several examples, not, not to take your time, not to bore you to death. Okay, I mentioned one thing, United Nations. The expression was invented by the Soviet propaganda experts, not by Americans. We know perfectly well it's not united and it has nothing to do with nations. More than half of the delegations in the UN do not represent any nation at all. Uh, they are disunited, obviously. Uh, the United Nations had not been able to solve a single military conflict. Nowhere in the world. Uh, they provoked war, yes. They took part in wars, but they didn't prevent expansion of communism or, or they did not prevent a single war anywhere. So the true expression, the true term for United Nations could be disunited bureaucracies. <laughs> okay, another cliche which was coined in Moscow by experts of propaganda. National Liberation Movement. It's not national because most of the leaders do, do not necessarily belong to the ethnic group which they lead, number one. Number two, they are unpatriotic and unnationalistic because they they obey orders from a foreign country, USSR. Okay? They are trained in USSR, they are paid by the Soviet system, and they, they work in the interests of the Soviet system. Liberation. Whom they are liberating? Who is being liberated? And movement. Movement, we understand, is something which moves, unlike uh, something which is static. National liberation does not move. It's a war. If, if, you, if you call war a movement, probably, but it, it has nothing to do with uh, the concept of movement in, in American terminology. It means a legitimate, overt, organized, voluntary uh, movement, right? I presume your, your church or your organization is voluntary. Nobody keeps you here by force. Okay, National Liberation Movement is an army of bandits, professional bandits, which are kept, kept in, within the framework of the movement by force. If they betray, it's like in mafia, they are going to be executed. Okay, another example <coughs> of semantic manipulation is, uh, mm, okay, mm, free medical aid, for example. You think it's, it's an American democratic expression. No way. The, this, the, the term was coined by, by the communists long time ago at the time of Comintern. There's nothing free in this world. Everybody knows it. Least of all, medical aid. It's a very expensive thing to render medical assistance to other people. To... Somebody, sometime, somewhere has to pay for it. Who? Taxpayer. Okay. Obviously. There are many other things that are being coined by, by the Soviet propaganda apparatus. Unfortunately, see, if, if I call myself a genius, a genius writer, for example, Los Angeles Times would not call me that. Right? They will call me a strange, crazy Russian who calls himself a genius. Then why the hell they call liberation movements uh, liber what, what, what they call themselves? Just because they are many? Hmm? The logic is twisted. Um, the stickers on, on, on the bumpers, I don't know. It, it, it depends on the uh, ability of local forces to 
to uh, tow up the uh, tow the foreign policy. How close is Politburo to to implementation of propaganda actions? Very distant. See, Politburo is a group of self-imposed dictators. They don't really decide anything. The only uh, objective of their existence and their life and their struggle is to stay in power. Unlike American politician who has two objectives. First, to be elected, and second, to be re-elected. <laughs> the, so the, so the Soviet politician doesn't have the first objective. He does not have to be elected. He just makes his way in the party structure all the way up. The election doesn't bother him at all. So the only purpose of his life is to stay where he is and don't rock the boat. They don't make decisions. The decision-making level are the faceless group of experts, as I, as I tried to explain to you. And they, the, the Politburo gives only the basic directions, what to be done. And the obedient servants of the highest caliber, intellectuals, are dutifully developing these things. Um, some independently thinking, progressive academics in the United States think that come socialism, they will be able to preserve their integrity and independence. It's wishful thinking. They will become obedient servants of the system that they are trying to force upon you. Uh, the Korean airliner incident, from my viewpoint, is not an incident at all. I believe it's, it's, a, it's a carefully planned and premeditated provocation. I'm not sure whether they did it, they killed two, 268 people just to get rid of Larry McDonald, but it, it's feasible. I wouldn't be surprised if they killed uh, more than 60 millions of their own men just to implement rotten ideas of, of Marx and Engels. You know, what, what, what would 268 people matter? Uh, second, it, it is not a military blunder, and, and it, the order was not given by military. Never a single military officer of the highest caliber will take responsibility to shoot a civilian airliner. My father was an officer of general staff of the Soviet Army. I know perfectly well what I'm talking about. No officer would take responsibility. He'll be shot tomorrow. Are you kidding? It's, the order was given by a civilian, by party apparatchik of the highest caliber, and I wouldn't be surprised it was Andropov. In any case, Andropov knew perfectly well what goes on, what, goes on, what went on. The Soviet power structure resembles a triangle, unlike a love triangle in, in real life drama. It's a hate triangle. The, the seats of power are <coughs> party, Communist Party, the elite. Of course, not the rank and file party, but the top of the pyramid. The KGB and the military, they hate each other. And each of them hate the other two. The, the, mo the most powerful is the party. This is the real power. The army and the KGB supposedly are servants of the party and the tools, the instruments of their power. But in fact, sometimes they are the power themselves. Andropov belongs to the most hated triangle, the KGB. My father hated KGB because he was military. Both of them, KGB and military, hate the party. Why? Because unlike in the United States, the party is the most adventuristic people. They want to invade countries. They give the orders for all kinds of adventures outside of USSR waters. They know perfectly well that comes war, they will go to bunkers and eat caviar and enjoy life, whereby military will burn in flames of nuclear war. Marshal Grechko was against invasion into Czechoslovakia because he knew that he will have to demoralize his army. And the first two divisions, after facing the reality and seeing that Czechoslovakia is not being invaded by Americans, will get corrupted. So you have to replace them with other two divisions. And if you stay long enough, you will corrupt the whole Soviet army. He said, no, don't invade Czechoslovakia. But Comrade Brezhnev said, who the hell they are? They think they, they deserve more sausages and butter. So show them thanks. So he did, he obeyed. Uh, the, 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 KGB, the, the KGB and the army sometimes are in cahoots against the party. The recent rumor that Andropov was shot 
by son of Brezhnev is an indication that the, the other two corners of the power structure were really sick and tired of, of, the, of the Andropov's KGB purges. You know, there were purges. The, the many people lost their jobs and some were arrested and some committed suicide in the span of some 10, uh, uh, ten months since Andropov was sentenced to power. So that gives you an idea of well, the Korean airliner incident is premeditated provocation to create an international tension because the only power on earth which is interested in provoking conflicts and preserving tension is the Soviet junta. That's the only justification of them being in power. If there is no enemy outside, they have to create him. If there is no war, they have to provoke it to scare the hell out, out of taxpayers inside and to keep themselves in power. There are so many theories. Uh, one of them is expressed by, I wouldn't say a friend of mine, but I know him. There's, there's another defector, Nikolai Kochlov, who defected long time before I even joined KGB. Uh, he was also a KGB in, in Western Europe. Now he is, teaches psychology in, in one of California universities. He thinks that the Soviet Union developed an ESP, would you believe it, system of influencing the perception and minds of people and the the generators of ESP willpower can be focused on individuals and groups of individuals so efficiently that you can literally focus that beam or whatever it is on a pilot or two pilots or three pilots and convince them that actually they are flying on the safe territory so there is no need that you can convince them that there is no need to to contact the, the, the ground base station and you can artificially draw the plane by brainwave into the Soviet airspace. Whether it is true or not, I don't know. But I know one thing, that when I was a student and I graduated from Oriental Studies Institute, one of my friends, he was an extremely intelligent Jewish boy, he graduated from the mathematical uh, department of Moscow State University. After three years, I returned from India for, for vacation, and I met him in the, um, on, uh, during the reception at the Academy of Science. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm working in the secret research bureau. You know, the secret, which means basically defense industry. They don't have addresses, they have post box numbers. And I say, it's not, is it that much secret that you cannot tell me what you research? He said, you wouldn't believe me? Brain waves. And I never saw him again. <laughs> uh, ESP, which officially in the Soviet media is uh, described as a pseudoscience and decadent capitalist gimmick to sidetrack the minds of proletariat from the real issues of class struggle. But obviously KGB takes seriously that uh, pseudoscience.